from the Indian side, actually, he has been a guide for almost every HPV surgeon in India. He has put India on the world map, and he is the only person so far who has been the president of the International IHPBA. Very fortunate, and he has uh, conducted very successfully one of the world congresses here, and which has shown to the world what India is. And from that time, actually, there has been never a uh, uh, we have been going forward from that time, and we see a lot of youngsters who have chosen HPV as a specialty after that World Congress that came to India. And Dr. Jagannath has got innumerable number of publications to his credit, a lot of work both on the private and public sector, and also a lot of social work that he's been doing. And he has a, had extensive experience, and we just wanted him to give his overall perspective of 30 and odd years of his practice in HPV surgery, just to share his views, what was in the past, what is in the present, and what is his advice to the juniors in the future. I request Professor Jagannath to take the air time and the screen time. Uh, can, you, can you unshare your screen? Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you, GV, and thank you, Olympus, for bringing it uh, together. I kind of uh, had this title in mind when we... Uh, when I was asked to see, uh, speak on this uh, very, very important webinar. The title I thought about is The Old Man and the Sea. Who is the old man? I am the old man, actually. Though, uh, yeah, it has been uh, quite a journey. Yes, the old man and the sea is a, a metaphor for uh, a very famous, and I'm sure that all of you know, the Ernest Hemingway's uh, novel, uh, which is his last major work, won him the Pulitzer Prize and the Nobel Prize. And he had this romantic idea of a life uh, of an old man spending time in the human village called Santiago. And he had uh, to sail persistently on rough seas to catch fish. For 84 days, he went fishing in the rough seas and could not get a fish. And he was kind of disappointed, but not completely dejected. And he said, I'll go further down into the rough sea and then catch the fish. And he set out and finally caught a big fish, marlin. And then he tries to drag it uh, back home alone. But he was successful finally to come back home with a large fish, partly eaten away by sharks. This actually is... Uh, a kind of a semi-autobiographical uh, story about uh, Hemingway, who, who himself, you can see with a huge marlin and the old man on the sea being illustrated in his novel. So he was this, uh, this man who was possessed to do something different, something new and something uh, challenging. And uh, that's, that's catching this uh, metaphorically large fish in a rough sea. When we started the liver surgery, it was very similar. And that's the reason why I thought I can use this. Now I'm an old man, uh, but I was pretty young in 1986. Liver surgery was an uncharted sea. It was, uh, it was difficult. It was not popular because invariably the patient had problems uh, with intraoperative bleeding, postoperative uh, bleed. And it was really uh, something which people avoided if they can as much as they wanted. But it was the price was pretty big in the sense that it was a huge organ which was untamed and difficult to control and catch. When you say catch and control, that some, somehow resonates with liver surgeons because that's what you need to actually do. You need to control, control the inflows, control the outflows, and catch the the uh, the vessels intact. So. Very similar, very rough seas because liver surgery means it, it, things can be uh, quite, uh, there can be a torrential bleed, which can be uh, like a very, very stormy sea. So it was very similar as far as metaphorical uh, way is concerned. That was how young I was at that time, which you can see with uh, late Prime Minister uh, Rajiv Gandhi. I'll just give you an introduction of how we went into liver surgery and leave the future for all the younger colleagues who are here. I have to consider that Professor Bakabayashi is a very younger colleague. 
because he's so young at heart that certainly he qualifies as far as I'm concerned as a young colleague. After general surgical residency, we started as a surgical oncologist and then a gastrointestinal surgical oncologist and finally into HPV surgical oncologist. At each stage, I had to sacrifice to become more and more focused and on a very narrow area of HPV. At that time, I, I had to uh, say that Dr. Silesh Srikande, who is the, the lead speaker in, uh, in this uh, seminar, was our research fellow. And as I look at it, look at look back at him, he has even sacrificed more from HPB to be focusing only as a pancreatic surgeon. And that, that's how the, the development happens that you need to do more and more about less and less. This webinar is not about my talking about what how we have done the X number of hepatectomies, et cetera, which is which is something which is uh, which is there but how we actually were motivated and how I, we started getting the HPB surgery in India as a kind of a discipline. The disease load was there. The number of patients who needed surgery was significant and HPB surgery was going to become a common surgery. There was a challenge and unfortunately in India and anywhere in abroad, even now, the training of a HPB surgeon is challenging. They don't really fit into a single basket of either minimal invasive surgeons or surgical gastroenterologists or transplant surgeons. So it's a kind of a, a, a multi-disciplinary uh, approach. They definitely need an additional training, even if you're a good general surgeon, good GI surgeon, because this is a differently a different area of expertise. For. So we need to, we had, Straight away, uh, kind of identified that HPB surgery needs specialized training. It may be lab, it may be open, but yes, it needs specialized training. And these surgeons have to come with multiple skills, not just the surgical skills. They need to be very good in their hepatology. They need to be good in their critical care because unless you are, have all these skills, so we need to collaborate and with cross-disciplinary approach, like you need to collaborate with the gastroenterologist, there are hepatologists with critical care experts, intervention radiologists, very important to re deliver a good care for your own patients. It was way back in 1993. I attended this conference of, so at that time there was no IHPB. IHPB was born in 1994 in Boston. This was a, an association which was prior to IHPB called World Association of HPB. And I had a Congress in Paris. I was very young, I went there. I met three people who have transformed me completely and made me realize that this is my, going to be my passion. There was an elderly gentleman sitting in a sofa outside and everyone used to go there, stand next to him and take a picture. I was a novice, I didn't even know who he was. After some of, at least maybe at least five or six Japanese went and clicked the picture, I quietly called someone along this, who is this person? Why is he so prominent? He said, you don't know, he's Claude Cuno, the surgeon anatomist who gave the segmental anatomy to the liver surgeons. Before that, it was, liver surgery was an absolute hemorrhagic mess. And it was Claude Cuno, a French surgeon turned anatomist who completely changed this. And there's another young HPB surgeon who presented his data about 100 plus hepatectomies, right major hepatectomies without a blood transfusion. And that was Jacques Belgetti. Jacques Belgetti, a brilliant liver surgeon from, uh, from uh, Paris who did major liver surgeries and also contributed significantly to the, the physiology of liver resection. This is very important because the Jacques Belgetti who said in that particular meeting, I didn't clearly remember, saying that the inflow is not important. It is the outflow which is important in liver. Leave the Pringle alone. Pringle has been overrated and overdone. It is the outflow of the hepatic veins, outflow of the biliary system which is to be taken care. And that was really a big revelation. And that's when we realized about low CVP and anesthetic management and intraoperative management rather than put a Pringle and then go in for a liver split. And finally, 
I have to say that it was, if at all, if I had done any learning of HPV surgery, it was under Professor Yuji Nimura. Seeing him, calling him to India and Jack Belgetti for a live workshop was like a turning point for many of the HPV surgeons in India. Claude Cuno with his, the casts of uh, liver and saying that this is anatomically the segmentation, which is what we follow now. This is called the Cuno's uh, segments. One important thing, which I'm sure that Professor Wakabayashi will also come back to you, is that how you see the liver. Cuno saw the liver when he took it out at the cadaveric dissections on the bench. But when we see the liver, the liver is in situ, that means it is rotated, and so called the lateral segments of Cuno are actually posteriorly placed. So, and when Dr. Wakabayashi looks at liver, he looks at through a laparoscope, which is, gives a different perspective as far as liver anatomy is concerned. But these are important as to how you look at the liver. Anatomy is the same, but how you look at the liver is what makes it all the difference. These are some of the original cadaveric dissections we did from the anatomy labs to see the QNOS uh, segmentation of the liver, which is now all of you know very well that the hepatic veins and the segments and the various sectors of the liver, which are very well known. These are the segments on the uh, listing, which I don't want to spend. Now, this is the second huge, huge, every time in your life, you get an event, which is kind of is like how the COVID pandemic has transformed the healthcare and the economic, uh, uh, and the whole global uh, system has been completely changed. You always have these transformative events in your life. This was a transformative event, uh, at least about uh, three, four years after we had the first live workshops. The World Congress of IHPBA, which GV was alluding in Mumbai, this was like, it was like an unbelievable booster for HPB surgery in India. You see here Professor Yuji Nimura in his sparkling best, and Professor Henri Bismuth, who is the father of the French liver surgery. Even now, they preserve these dresses, and even now, they remember the Mumbai World Congress as though it was a landmark event for them. It was a huge landmark event for us because we had the people like uh, Blumgart, Bismuth, of course, Professor Nimura, Belgetti, and a host who is who of HPB surgery here in India. That gave us a tremendous amount of confidence and the boost. And as Dr. Rao has said, the boost for HPB surgery from just about two or three centers uh, before the World Congress, now close to 30 centers do excellent HPB surgeries. And they have gone way beyond the uh, way beyond what we'd imagined. As far as the scale is concerned, the numbers of procedures are concerned, also the types of procedures are concerned, that India continues to lead. For the last three World Congresses, India has been amongst the top three as far as the academic contribution is concerned, as far as abstracts are concerned. So India, Indian surgeons, Indian HPV surgical community was not just about doing some uh, surgeries or the number of surgeries. It was about contribution to the world academic HPB uh, work, which is substantial as far as the Indian surgeons are concerned in any, every field. And today you'll hear some of them, in, that is uh, uh, Dr. Shrikande talking about pancreatic surgery. Now many of them have become internationally recognized, respected and valued uh, colleagues. And the entire kind of a booster came from the World Congress in 2008. And there was really no looking back after the World Congress. What did I learn from Professor Nimura? And this is what I would just leave it as a last slide as far as the future is concerned, be it a lap surgery or an open surgery. Meticulous planning, meticulous planning. That means everything is done before surgery on what is the procedure going to be. It may be 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the night, but it has to be planned well. Execution according to the plan which has been done, which is very important. And then afterwards you get a post-surgical analysis as to what is been, did we do anything uh, different from the plan which we thought, and can we do it anything different? Or, and this commitment to excellence. If there is someone in the world, even every single person, 
even someone like Jack Belgetti, once he was operating, said that, oh, I wish Professor Nimura has been here to operate this case. That's a kind of a respect. It comes out of commitment to excellence. And that's what Professor Nimura has uh, taught us. And that's what we'd like to uh, practice throughout our professional life. I must say that, you know, when we went under Professor Go Wakabayashi's uh, leadership, that a meeting, a consensus meeting on lap liver surgery, it was some time, which was early years of uh, HPB surgery. I was there, Steve Strasberg was there, uh, Norihiro Kukuro was there from the open surgical side, and a host of a galaxy of lap liver surgeons, uh, including Dr. Wakabayashi, Daniel Shirky, and many others, for representing the lap liver program and presented their data. It was very interesting, academically debates, stimulating uh, program. And that was the beginning of an uh, international lap liver surgical society, which is a thriving organization, which is uh, really on the front line of lap liver surgery. And uh, uh, Go, then Daniel, and many others have been leaders in this field and taken it for further forward than anyone else. So I, I see a great potential for lap liver surgery. At that time, we concluded only the lateral segment was, uh, was the right approach. But now you see that every type of hepatectomy or segmental resection and donor hepatectomies are all done through lap approach. So, but at the same time, it also uh, brings, with the, brings to us a commitment to ensure that the training and the excellence are all there. These points which are here on the slide will continue to be uh, very, very important for the lap liver surgery, that meticulous planning, execution with the right kind of technologies, documenting even if there is a fault or the problem, and always commitment to excellence. Ultimately, it is the, the patient who really matters, not the technology and not your preferences. So we need to ensure that we have that commitment to excellence ensure a great patient care. I, I leave this uh, with uh, this thing that equivalence is not excellence. Excellence is truly a significant difference as far as the outcome is concerned. It's no longer the pain relief, it's no longer the recovery time. It is truly something which makes the patients come and say that I really prefer a lap over open surgery, which is I can see it happening very quickly and I'm sure it will go a long way to transform the reverse surgery in India to the next level. I, I, I uh, see that there's a great program in which uh, Dr. Reddy is talking and then many others are talking. So I'm sure it will be an exciting webinar in lab uh, liver surgery and the biliary uh, GI. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. GV, for this opportunity. I'll stop at this and then look forward to hearing the rest of the masters. Thank you so much, uh, Jagannath. Actually, that was a fantastic thought, actually, showing us what has happened in the last 30 years and uh, your commitment to HPV surgery, how it evolved, and uh, your leadership that has put India on the world map of HPV, leading us all, including me, and showing us the path for this, actually, which we all started following in the last uh, 20 odd years. Thank you so much, actually. What you said is absolutely right. The HPB World Congress in India made all the difference and it changed the entire concept, the philosophy. People started going out to get trained in this speciality, which was not that uh, exposed and uh, people were not that qualified to operate. But now you see so many centers across India are actively participating. Thank you so much for those words of wisdom. Thank you so much for sparing your time, uh, Professor Jagannath, and I hope. We'll get back to you again. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, actually, now I have uh, with me, actually, Professor Vinayendra Pamecha, now who is the professor and head of the liver transplant and hepatobiliary uh, surgery at ILBS. Actually, uh, a good friend of mine, actually, uh, we have requested him. He's got phenomenal experience, I think. Uh, a lot of, they do almost about 200 plus transplants every year, both cadaveric and uh, living related. Uh, so I thought we'd ask uh, Professor Pamecha to talk on his uh, views on selection and optimization for liver resections. Actually, we'd be 
uh, for transplant or non-transplant actually, Professor Pamisha. Uh, can you share your slides uh, and then? Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Professor Vinayendra? Yeah, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was an excellent uh, talk from uh, Professor Jagannath. Really liked it, and uh, he has always been an inspiration for all of us uh, for HPV surgery in India. And thanks, uh, Professor Rao, for having me here. And thanks, uh, Onam Pars and uh, Professor Vakbashi uh, for uh, for the invitation as well. So what I'm going to do over the next uh, 15 minutes or so is uh, talk about selection and op optimization of patient for liver reception. Um, so as Professor uh, Jagannath has uh, highlighted already that uh, liver, uh, liver surgery has improved quite a lot over the last few decades. Uh, the morbidity and mortality has uh, significantly decreased. The mortality we talk about now 1-2% and morbidity has also decreased to less than 10% as well. And all that is because of uh, improvement in uh, perioperative care, uh, good selection of the patient, optimization of the patient before resection. And... Uh, obviously intraoperative techniques uh, about uh, um, uh, how to control the inflow and outflow and uh, how to control the blood loss as well. So when we talk about liver resection, when we look at the patient, so uh, what are the things we need to see is uh, obviously performance status matters a lot. And uh, we need to have an assessment in terms of uh, how their comorbidities are like diabetes, blood uh, hypertension and other things because uh, 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 the NAFLD is very common nowadays, so we need to evaluate all those as well. Obviously, if you're talking about uh, malignancy, then you need to stage the tumors properly in terms of uh, size, number, location, and uh, vascular invasion. Uh, vascular invasion per se are not a contraindication for liver resection. Uh, we can do still do them in, in terms of HCCs and hyalocalangios, even with vascular invasion can be resected. Extra hepatic disease, again, we need to evaluate carefully. When it comes to evaluating liver parenchyma, this is very important that we need to see what is the etiology of underlying liver disease. As I said, steatosis and steatohepatitis has become very common now. So we need to see, uh, evaluate in terms of whether they've got underlying NASH or alcoholic liver disease, or if in patient with colorectal metastasis, obviously cash becomes very important because most of them will have some new adjuvant or adjuvant therapies before coming to reception. Then in terms of uh, coming to HCCs, fibrosis and cirrhosis, uh, we need to evaluate that carefully as well. And there are various ways to do it, like transfer minus level, elastography and imaging, which can show us how, how much is the underlying extent of parenchymal damage is there. Then uh, there are uh, biological evaluation in terms of the child score and medal score, which can predict post-operative liver failure. And uh, they're very good at uh, predicting that. We're going to talk about that as well. And uh, then there are more, more important dynamic evaluation nowadays available, like ICG clearance or a scintigraphy. And if a patient is going uh, undergoing PVE, then the extent of hypertrophy, which happens after, after PVE, can tell us uh, how much is the risk of uh, post-resection low failure. Again, in patient with... Uh, with HCC, uh, it becomes important to evaluate underlying portal pressure, which can be done by indirect measures or it can be measured directly by HPVG as well. And then volumetry becomes very important that how much liver we are going to leave behind and what will be the function of that liver in order to avoid uh, morbidity and mortality. So what I'm going to do over this presentation is actually I'm going to take you through some cases and talk about how, how selection and optimization can be done. So this is uh, one of the patient, 66-year-old uh, gentleman. He had a fall, and he was found to have abnormal liver function test. And he went on to have an ultrasound, which showed an uh, SOL in the liver, uh, sitting between the segment four and uh, five and eight. So his viral markers were negative. He was child, child A, and his ICG clearance was 11%. He had no viruses, and his PET scan showed a cirrhotic liver with normal spleen, no collaterals, uh, there was no ascites, and there was SOL in segment 5 and 8, no total vein thrombosis or extra hepatic disease. So in this particular patient, they obviously had a comorbidity with diabetes and hypertension, and he's got an age as well, about 66. So most of the time, you would have thought he's a poor candidate for liver resection, 
But when we look at the data <clears throat> in terms of performance status, patient still with uh, ECOG performance status do much better than offering palliative therapy with TAS. So th this is the data from uh, for HCC, large set of data and uh, overall outcome in terms of uh, disease free as well. And overall survival is much better with surgery rather than offering palliative treatment. So this patient uh, <clears throat> actually because of his fracture femur, so we wanted to buy some time on him. So he underwent a taste to start with. And uh, uh, about six weeks after his taste, actually, we finally resected him. We did a central hepatectomy, uh, anterior sectionectomy for him, segment five and eight, and part of segment four as well. And he's eight months from his resection and he got no recurrence. This was in a solitary tumor as well. So that's how the performance is important. So it's not at this in this era of medicine, denying an operation just based on comorbidity or age or performance status is not a good idea. We need to properly evaluate patient before deciding this. Now coming to another case, this is a 58-year-old male with good performance. He had an upper abdominal pain on ultrasound. He was found to have a uh, SOL endeavor. He was hepatitis B positive. His tumor markers were within normal limit. Again, on CT, he had a cirrhotic liver and he had a large tumor in his cordate with mild splenomegaly. <clears throat> on PET, he had no extrapatic disease as well. So in this particular case, we've got a cirrhotic liver with grade one varices with mild splenomegaly and a platelet count of 100. So how to assess this patient? So there are various ways of doing this. One is simple child score. Child score can predict very well. Child A, if they're just child A, it's safe to do operation in them. Child B and C become tricky. C, uh, uh, we should not be offering resection to them. In early child B, there is always a chance that if they've got a good performance status, we can still perform a lower resection. And it depends on, a, on, on extent of lower resection we, we, we have to do. So we need to evaluate those patients carefully whether they can still be suitable for resection. MELD can predict, I'll show you the data. Then there are tests like uh, scintigraphy and ICG, I'll show that data as well. So MELD is a good predictor. MELD is, it was derived for TIPS, but uh, it's being used in transplantation in terms of organ allocation. And it's based on bilirubin, INR, and creatinine. And MELD of less than nine actually predicts uh, <clears throat> post hepatectomy liver failure very well. And uh, it's a simple calculation which can give us an idea of what is the risk of uh, their post hepatectomy liver failure. So this is again, if the MILD is nine, then the risk of uh, liver failure is almost negligible in those patients. Obviously, you can't take them in isolation. You have to evaluate the patient fully. Then again, platelet count can predict very well. The platelet count of less than 150, the risk of uh, major complication is uh, significantly low. If they have more than 150, uh, sorry, less than 150, then the risk of a major complication is very high. Um, and also the risk of mortality is high as well. So again, platelet, simple platelet count can also assess whether a patient, uh, what is the risk of this patient uh, undergoing a major hepatectomy. Then coming to eyes. ICG. ICG has become very popular and it is now available. I think most big centers who are doing liver surgeries will have ICG as one of the things to evaluate liver function and risk of post-operative liver failure. And uh, basically, this is a, a plasma disappearance rate and retention rate at uh, 15 minutes, which gives an idea about uh, post-hepatectomy liver failure. And uh, there is good data, actually. There are a lot of data on ICG, which is available. And uh, so how to use ICG? So in a patient who, if the patient has got ascites, then obviously they're not a candidate for liver resection. But if they have none or controlled ascites, if we need to see what is their bilirubin level. If bilirubin level is normal, then uh, again, uh, the uh, ICG-15, we see, need to see how much is the retention at 15 minutes. Bilirubin is uh, increased uh, between 1.1 to 1.5, then they can only have limited resection. If it is 1.6 to 1.9, you can still consider segmental resection. If it is in more than two, then uh, lower resection is in a way contraindicated. If ICG is normal, they can have trice bisectionectomy. There's no problem with that. <clears throat> if the ICG is between 10 to 19%, then either they can have a left hepatectomy or a monosegmentectomy. If it is between 20 to 29%, they can have a segmentectomy. 
if it is between 30 to 39 percent, they can have a limited wedge resection. So ICG can stratify patient about extent of liver resection. The limitation about ICG is obviously it still gives a global liver function. It doesn't give you the idea of what will be the remnant function after resection. And obviously in terms of when patient has got polystasis because of biliary obstruction, then again, ICG becomes, um, uh, the interpretation of ICG is difficult in those situations. So then uh, scintigraphy has become, uh, there's, there's centers where scintigraphy will be available, which can actually predict the function of the remnant, uh, remnant liver as well. So it's based on uh, basically the uh, uh, how much uh, nuclear absorption is there, and then it can give you an idea of what will be the function of the liver which is left behind after the resection. So this is some recent data. In this, basically, 24% uh, of patients were thought to be having a marginal liver and were at risk of uh, post hepatectomy liver failure. But when scintigraphy was done, about 16% of them still had good, uh, good liver function and could proceed to the resection. So scintigraphy can further stratify patient uh, who, who are considered to be marginal to have liver resection as well. Then there are other parameters which are available like a fibro scan, which has become very uh, widely available now. It's non-invasive, but uh, it is obviously observer dependent, but it can still show you how much is the stiffness in the liver and it can predict the post hepatectomy liver failure as well. So if you have an LSM of more than 14, then the risk is, uh, there is increased risk of uh, post hepatectomy liver failure as well. But this is, you know, it's available and you, obviously somebody who's got a LSM of more than 25 or those, they can easily stratify those patients to whether they, you should be offering liver resection to them or not. And, uh, then uh, sometimes when you think that still it is borderline and you're not clear about uh, how much is the, how good or bad is the liver parenchyma, then it is always wise to do a biopsy of the non-tumorous liver that can show you exactly how much is the steatosis, steatohepatitis, fibrosis, or early cirrhosis in those patients. And, and actually you can then predict uh, what is the possibilities of uh, them uh, having post hepatectomy liver failure or what, what will be their chances of pulling through liver resections. Then one of the things when we, we see very commonly patients with cirrhosis or early uh, chronic liver disease who having HCC, it is uh, one of our major reasons to do hepatectomy is to evaluate portal hypertension, which can be done directly by measuring the hepatic venous uh, gradient or by indirectly by looking at the clinically significant portal hypertension, which is whether there is presence of a varices, splenomegaly, or a platelet count less than, less than 100. So if you have clinically significant portal hypertension, then the risk of post-hepatectomy liver failure is very high. So there is high risk of post-operative mortality, high risk of post-operative complication, and uh, especially liver-related morbidity and liver failure as well. So clinically significant portal hypertension is easily available to stratify patient uh, uh, whether you should be offering them major liver resections or not. But then there is some controversial data on clinically significant portal hypertension as well. This is again large set of data where the patients were stratified between having hypertension, portal hypertension and not, not having portal hypertension. And when they did the propensity matching, there was no difference in terms of morbidity and mortality. And uh, basically, when you stratify the patient between early, early tumors, early stage tumors, uh, then, then the difference is lost. If they have advanced tumors, then the difference remains in terms of uh, portal hypertension is a significant factor for post hepatectomy liver failure. So early, early tumors, still you can consider liver resection for those patients with erotic liver having portal hypertension. Then uh, this is one thing which has come up and uh, which has become in vogue in terms of measuring the portal pressures directly uh, through hepatic venous uh, pressure gradient. And this was the data which was published about uh, a decade ago, uh, first in British Journal of Surgery, where uh, about 40 odd patients were evaluated and pressures were measured directly. And it showed that there was a direct, uh, there was a direct correlation between uh, morbidity and mortality in patient having an HPVG of more than 10. And subsequently, this data has come. 
which again showed that if you have an HPVG of more than 10, your risk is high, high of for developing post hepatectomy liver failure and mortality as well. But the one thing which was unexpected was the 17 patient with HPVG or less than had an uneventful post operative course. So, direct pressure measurement has got its own limitation, although it is good, but you can't just rely on one pressure measurement to stratify patient or to deny a patient a curative resection. So, that needs to be kept in mind. And especially when we see patients with large HCCs, like tumors like this big, HPVG cannot be of a um, it cannot be of uh, value because the veins are pulled, uh, veins are pushed, and if you're trying to measure pressures in those veins, they they will always give you a false reading. So large tumor HPVG, I don't think, is of helpful in in assessing portal hypertension. Uh, <clears throat> so coming back to our patient, so he had cirrhotic liver, he had grade one varices, mild splenomegaly with a platelet of 100, but his MELD score was seven, his ICG was 12 and he had a remnant of around 45%. So we decided we're going to reset this. And this was his liver intraoperatively. So we did a uh, uh, complete mode. Uh, the tumor was in the caudate lobe here. So we mobilized the whole of the caudate lobe <clears throat> and we did an extended right hepatectomy for him. That's the highlight section here. The right-sided pedicle has been uh, looped and that's the transection plane to the extended right hepatectomy and that's the specimen here. So that's his uh, follow-up scan. He is now almost five years with no recurrence, but he had developed decompensation has been, uh, we now plan to do a liver transplant for him. So coming to uh, liver volumes, again, <clears throat> this is a 49-year-old lady with the hepatitis B, child A, large HCC, and the right lobe and involving segment 4A. So just to give you an idea how volumetries are done, so when you're doing volumetries, basically what you need to do is you need to exclude the tumor volumes uh, and need to calculate the future liver, liver remnant. So FLR is more important than the volume of resected parenchyma. And uh, in a normal parenchyma, it would be around 25 to 30%. On cirrhosis, severe fibrosis on FLD, the, you should look at, a, like, look at it an FLR of 40 to 50%. FLR calculation, they can be done through manual way by CT scans or now more fancy softwares are available which can give you very good imaging uh, in terms of your location and exactly can point out, uh, point out what, would, what will be the transaction planes as well. So this is just to show the volumetry of this particular patient. So the liver, total liver was about 1700 or so. The tumor volume was about uh, really 800. And the remnant which was calculated in this patient was about 24%. She had a normal liver parenchyma, although she did have hepatitis B. So we thought that uh, because the amount of liver which was coming out was mainly tumorous, so we offered her the resection. And she again, she had an extended diet hepatectomy. Uh, this is the intraoperative photographs, um, highlight dissection, parenchymal transection, and that's the completion of extended diet hepatectomy, and that's the specimen for she had an R0 resection with HCC. She did develop recurrence uh, two years after uh, this one, and she's having RF ablation for that. So how to uh, optimize FLR, future liver remnant? So again, a case, 21-year-old uh, gentleman, non-smoker, good performance. He had a right upper quadrant pain. He was evaluated and found to have SOL well liver chronic hepatitis B. He did have a biopsy from the normal liver which showed chronic hepatitis B with minimal activity. When we did his volumetry, his, he, his on assessment, he, he required an extended right hepatectomy. So the left lateral segment was only 19, 90 cc. That was about 15% of his total, uh, total liver volume, excluding the tumor volume. So what are the methods of increasing future liver remnant volume? So there are two ways of doing it. One is to do a portal vein embolization. That is to embolize the epsilateral portal vein, and then you will get a growth onto the opposite side. And once the remnant is grown, then you can go and resect it. Uh, that's just to show how, the, how portal vein embolization can lead to hypertrophy of the future liver remnant. The other way is to do an uh, ALPS procedure that is associating liver partition and portal vein ligation. So in this, basically, you go in as a stage operation. In uh, first stage, you transect the parenchyma and ligate the portal vein on the epsilateral side and let the parenchyma grow onto the opposite side. And after a week or uh, 
for 10 days, you go back again when the parenchyma has grown sufficiently and you take out the tumorous level. So it, portal vein embolization has been there for decades now and it has been shown to increase the FLR volume. This is our own data which showed good significant increase in the, in the liver volumes. And uh, there is a survival benefit after doing portal vein embolization by making more patients receptible after this. And one of the things with portal vein embolization is it can lead to increase uh, growth rate of colorectal uh, of liver, liver tumors. And there have been concerns about uh, increasing tumor growth after portal vein embolization, but those concerns are mainly, uh, they don't actually impact overall survival or recurrence-free survival. So this was again uh, our own data from UK as well. We did show there was increased growth rate, but there was no impact on overall survival or recurrence rate as such. Dr. Pamit, so, uh, yeah, uh, yes. already, yeah, 15 minutes is a little bit over, so that could you a little bit, yeah. Can I just another minute? I will finish. Yeah, yeah. If you can. Oh, you want me to stop? You, no, no, no. I, you I can, you can continue. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Can I continue or shall I stop? Yeah, you can continue. Yeah. Okay. One. I think I. I won't take more than a minute or two. Okay. Right. Yeah. So in terms right. of feasibility, safety of portal vein embolization, it is overall mortality is around two point two percent. Mortality is zero percent. Growth rate is around 11, 12 percent. And the section is about resection rate is about 85%, and post resection mortality is about 0.8%. So it's quite safe to do portal vein embolization. When we compare portal vein embolization with the ALPS, so ALPS has got a limited limited application in terms of intrahepatic liver tumors not involved in the hilum because if you do the hilar dissection, then again you're invading the planes. And ALPS has been shown to be associated with increased morbidity and mortality. So that's where the two procedures uh, are different. Uh, and in, when we take growth rate, obviously growth rate is much more with ALPS than portal vein embolization, but uh, overall morbidity and mortality is much higher with ALPS. And uh, when we compare volume versus function, then again, the function is much better with portal vein embolization than, uh, than ALPS. Okay. So I'll, I'll skip this. Yeah, the portal vein embolization has also evolved. And now we're talking about total venous deprivation. That is, we can combine portal vein embolization along with the venous, uh, hepatic venous embolization. And that can actually lead to much better hypertrophy uh, of the future liver amyloid, and which is much significantly much better than what we compare with ALPS. Okay. So this is again our own patient. Uh, he had a portal vein embolization and there was significant growth in future liver remnant. And that was around 35%. And we went on and resected uh, and did an extended right hepatectomy for him as well. So just a word about parenchymal preserving technique. So we don't need to always think about portal vein embolization. Sometimes you can preserve a lot of parenchyma by just modifying the operation. So again, one of the patient large tumor in the right lobe of liver encroaching out with the segment four as well. And uh, this was a... Uh, big tumor in segment seven and eight. So we resected the segment seven, eight, and four A as well in this patient. So that's how the resection was. Okay. This was a leomyoma. So they always don't need to think about portal vein embolization. There are other ways you should always be open about in terms of uh, how you can anatomically reset those things. Then the last word about uh, uh, preoperative biliary drainage. This is very important. Uh, again, our one of our case with an uh, obstructive jaundice, bilirubin was stained with an hilar mass, and USFNA was adenocarcinoma. So whether to do a preoperative biliary drainage or not to do it has always been a question. And what the data shows that if you have got an FLR of more than 30%, then the, <clears throat> then the risk of, risk of postoperative hepatic insufficiency is almost 0%, and the mortality is also 0%. So you don't need to consider in every patient about draining uh, biliary drainage before the operation. So if it is around, bilirubin is around 10, and if you've got a good uh, FLR, then you can still uh, consider upfront resection as well. So this was our own patient, Hyla mass, and this is Hyla dissection. And uh, everything has been uh, taken off from the, from the vessels. And uh, we did a formal right hepatectomy with uh, caudate for this lady. 
So bleed rage only indicated if the age is um, on a higher side, poor performance status, prolonged jaundice, cholangitis, or you're combining with both human embolization. So that's my last slide. So thorough preoperative evaluation is key to successful liver surgery. With proper selection and optimization, morbidity and mortality can be decreased significantly. Select patient with portal hypertension can be offered liver resection with acceptable morbidity and mortality. Controversy is remain between PV and ALPS. At this stage, PV fares better. And P operative bleed drainage is not mandatory. In good risk patient, you can still go ahead and do major liver resection without drainage. Once again, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pamechan. That was a very beautiful talk on the uh, selection and optimization of patients for liver resections. Uh, from this, actually, we go on to the most awaited lecture of this webinar. Uh, it's my proud privilege to introduce Professor Go Bokabayashi. Now, Professor Go Bokabayashi is the director, Center for Advanced Treatment of Hepatobiliary and Pancreatic Diseases at the Ajo Central General Hospital. All of us know about Professor Bokabayashi's contribution to liver surgery. He's been a pioneer, a world leader, uh, and he's been guiding a lot of younger surgeons and training surgeons from across the globe at his center, and also touring across the globe to spread the message of minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery in liver. And he has had developed several of his innovations which have led to improved outcomes in liver surgery in laparoscopic area. And uh, People have been wanting to listen to you, Professor Go Bakabayashi. It's my proud privilege to introduce, and it's also an honor to have you on the webinar. And we profoundly thank you for sparing the time to share your views with the audience across the globe, predominantly the Indian audience in the Asia Pacific regions, to see how we have done all this to improve the outcomes and what are the messages that you convey to the younger surgeons who are getting into HPP surgery. Professor, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Professor Al. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Professor Jagana and uh, his wonderful speech. I still remember vividly his uh, you know, Congress in the Mumbai. Actually, that was my first time to visit India. I was very much impressed with uh, the organization. And um, I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes and to talk about uh, uh, you know, basics of uh, lap liver surgery, but uh, I'm kind of uh, very much uh, excited because uh, for the last couple of years, I feel, you know, the liver surgery has changed a lot, like uh, using uh, ICG technology. So I'm going to talk about uh, how I perform a lap liver surgery using uh, following the appropriate intersectional segment of plane. That could be a very much, I thought, I think interesting topic for you guys because I realized that very much uh, advanced liver surgery exists in India. So I, again, I also uh, appreciate the leadership of Professor Jaganan. Probably, you know, he propagate those kind of an very much advanced HPP surgery all over India. So I very enjoyed the talk of previous uh, speaker and also as well. So Professor Rao, could you please start my video from your side? Uh, yeah, Dr. Roy, I'm just playing it. Uh, Dr. Roy, I'm playing it. Yeah. yeah, with narration. Yeah. Can you see it? No? Yeah. Yes. So, may I play it now, sir? Yes. Thank you very much for this kind of invitation. I will talk about the basic to uh, advanced laparoscopic liver section following the appropriate intersectional plane. I have no conflict of interest. I think a standardization is the key for a reproducible lap liver section. Our standardization for lap liver section, number one indication, around 90% indication uh, in our hospital we exclude vascular biliary reconstructions. Number two, preoperative evaluation is almost uh, e equal for every patient. We use a ICG retention rate test for routinely and the liver function. And uh, we ask a radiologist to create 
a 3D image by a DICOM data of a CAT scan. Number three, a surgical procedure, which I'm going to talk later, is very much standardized, bring goods and pole position. And uh, number four, post-operative care is also very much standardized. We don't drain uh, mostly and fast track protocol follow up. This is, I think, very important to slide. Uh, when you use energy devices, you have to think about the ability of a dissection and hemostatic ability uh, in those energy devices. For example, bipolar scissors are very sharp, but uh, uh, hemostatic ability is a little bit less. And the harmonic and ACE or sonicision or harmonic HD are very sharply dissect, but uh, again, hemostatic ability is a little bit less. And uh, Ligasure and seal is uh, very good to uh, hemostatic ability, but a little bit less with uh, dissection ability. Sandovit is uh, kind of a, a better um, hemostatic ability and also a dissection ability too. I'd like to emphasize that CUSA with soft coagulation is a very important uh, um, device for um, hemostasis because the cusin is a suction and uh, with uh, electrocautery, so you can coagulate uh, bleeding point by suctioning the blood. As you know, CUSA is uh, very uh, safe and um, most surgeons of uh, donor hepatectomy uses uh, CUSA for the precise um, parenchymal transection, but it's a bit expensive. This is our setting for OR. So operation uh, table is sur surrounded by four, five, six monitors. And um, usually um, scrub nurse is uh, just right side of the uh, operator. So right and left side liver section, we don't mobilize the li uh, liver basically. And uh, patient uh, leg closed, this is I think a not French position, I would say Japanese position. It's easier for oral setting and the supine head up and uh, pe uh, operator stands on the right side of a patient. And we use four 12 millimeter trocars routinely because uh, through these 12 millimeter trocars, we can use CUSA, we can place a gaze, we can place a uh, ultrasonogram easily. So this is our routine. And uh, camera port is usually a navel button. And the Pringle, we routinely use the Pringle extracorporeally. So Pringle tape should be uh, used for uh, less left um, side of the body. And uh, instrument of operators also the standardized right hand energy devices for bipolar scissors, LCS, bipolar sealer, and cuser, and left hand, usually bipolar forceps, bisect or by clamp to stop bleeding. This is the right side, left side of the liver. We try not to mobilize the liver as much as possible so that we can perform another liver resection, re reduce surgery easily, and also uh, we use anti adhesive spray uh, routinely. So, but uh, if you include the seven uh, quinos, Seven, uh, seven quino segment. A patient usually on the semi lateral position to rotate. But again, legs are closed and the patient operation operator stands on the right side of the patient and right hand instrument, left hand instrument, uh, uh, same. And uh, sometimes because we routinely use infrared uh, camera, it is only a rigid camera everywhere. So we place uh, sometimes intercostal port for segment 8, 7 lesion, and also four 12 millimeter port for uh, the post forceps and the Pringle tape. And sometimes uh, we ask the first assistant to place his uh, or her left hand to hold the river if the river is big, fatty, fragile, and uh, mobilization of the river can be done easily with a uh, uh, hand assisted way. And also, we do a grisonal pedicle, a grisonal approach a lot, 
But uh, when we perform Grison approach, I follow this uh, COE, six gates and Lenek capsule. So this is uh, proposed by Professor Sugioka. And um, gate one, gate two, you can tape. Then uh, two, three, Grison and two, three uh, will be uh, taped. And uh, gate two and three is uh, Grison uh, four. And one and three is a left hepatectomy. And uh, four and five in anterior sector, five and six in the posterior sector. We also uh, respect the G1C and G, uh, uh, G1L. So Lenin capsule, you can visualize if the liver is cirrhotic or very hard, like, uh, you know, once you uh, recognize the Lenin capsule, this is shining membrane in the Lenin capsule. Um, covering uh, liver parenchyma, you can create easily create a space between the liver parenchyma or Lenac capsule and uh, glycerin and cheese. That is a Lenac capsule. But um, we recommend young surgeon don't too much respect to a uh, Lenac capsule. It's better to damage a uh, uh, liver rather than damage a Lenac capsule and liver rather than damaging uh, glycerin and cheese. So I'm going to show you a one case, uh, laparoscopic segment eight anatomical resection, hepatocellular carcinoma. This is uh, published on Annals of Surgical Oncology. So segment eight, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, 80 years old, 80s female. And uh, that uh, cobalt blue part is uh, segment eight with a cyst. So we identify, identify where to ligate. We identify the G8 root. Then I clamp from the hyla plate. Then I uh, ask an histologist to inject it in the signing green to see a negative staining. So hepatic reserve is uh, uh, less, 15%, uh, ICG 28%. As I said, you know, our technique is very much standardized. This is operative view. So the sonogram revealed a hepatocarcinoma a little bit large. This is a G8, so we can ligate the root of a G8 from the hyla plate. That's it. Then we're going to uh, see a right hepatic vein or thing, those things like this. We routinely use a uh, contrast medium ultrasonogram like this. Hypervascular tumor is now stained, and uh, always start uh, division around the root of a hepatic vein so that uh, we know the goal of uh, you know the dissection again as i said you know we don't mobilize the right liver just to visualize the root of a light hepatic vein and middle hepatic vein tumor is already shining because uh, this patient received a uh, icg retention test for two weeks before the surgery then i don't mobilize again but uh, just to, um, to reveal where is the root of a right hepatic vein then i place a uh, uh, Pringle maneuver tape. I think it's uh, easy to place the tape above uh, spiegel loaf and a little bit caldo side from a cotrell, co extra corporeal. So this patient, we see, uh, you know, try to visualize a lenic capsule, anterior trunk here, and uh, cystic plate is there. I try to open the uh, anterior trunk. Um, but I decided to damage uh, uh, parenchyma rather than respecting uh, a lenac capsule and to damage, then damaging uh, Grishon and Shears. So this is anterior trunk. We sometimes use a CUSA to uh, see, to perform a Grishon approach like this. Now the anterior trunk is taken by yellow tape. So, V5, couple of V5 is going to be visualized by CUSA, G5. So we tape those G5 and preserve it. Another one. 
So um, this is a root of G8. So G8 is now taped by kind of a subtraction. Yeah, to G5 is uh, preserved like this, yes. And this is a root of G8. Then I place a new unit as a landmark for interoperative ultrasonogram, you see very nicely landmark G8. So this is exactly what we want to clamp. It's now flow before clamping, then I clamp it. After clamping of G8, no flow. So we, are confer we confirm that this area is a G8. And I again ask an anesthesiologist to uh, give a uh, in the sign in green, 0 0.5 milligram per body. Then we see a clear demarcation line on the surface. Then we place, a, we mark the demarcation line on the surface. This is, looks like a donut a tumor is also shining due to the preoperative in the sign in green retention test. Then we start cutting the superficial parenchyma. I recommend the young surgeon to uh, cut all the way along the area to be resected. The superficial dissection is opening. Then you have a little bit movable uh, area to be resected. So move the ground is very important for laparoscopic surgery, even though uh, hepat uh, laparoscopic hepatectomy. So once you open uh, parenchyma, then you start to visualize the root of a uh, right hepatic vein and mid hepatic vein. And uh, we prefer to start parenchymal transection from uh, root of a hepatic vein to a uh, caudal side, so cranial caudal approach. This is a cyst, and um, we visualize a middle hepatic vein branch. Actually, this is a, a little bit grison and pedicle comes from uh, segment four. It's, uh, you know, this cystic, cyst is a location, cyst location is just between the segment four A and eight. So I'm trying to uh, find the G8, which I clamped from the hyaloplate. Then you see, even during a parenchyma transection in the deep inside the parenchyma, you see still clear demarcation line between segment eight and segment seven. So nicely visualize the intersectional segmental plane. I think this is a key concept of a, um, you know, modern liver resection, especially for laparoscopic surgery. You try to expose the root of a, a middle right hepatic vein, and also try to find appropriate intersectional plane, intersegmental plane, V8 ventral. I think V8 ventral should be ligated. V8 ventral usually runs between the segment A dosal, segment A ventral. So this is a full monosegmentectomy 8. So segment A uh, ventral sh should be anterior fissure vein, should be uh, ligated, uh, developed. So we found a clip which I placed uh, from the hyla plate uh, at the bottom of uh, at the bottom of uh, um, G8 to area to be resected. Then I placed a uh, staple the G8. That time I used a staple a lot, but a lot. But nowadays I recommend a clip rather than staple because we experience a couple of uh, by leakage by uh, using a stapler because stapler is makes a hole of a duct because it's a stapler. So I think a clipper is better for to clip a small grease on a pedicle like this. Again, uh, intersegmental plane is nicely visualized between segment one and segment eight. Then we uh, dosal, uh, right about the vein is preserved. Then now mono segment eight monosegmentectomy is going to be completed. 
So now uh, right hepatic vein is visualized there. So I think, uh, yes, intersectional sectional plane on the uh, hepatic veins running along the segmental sectional plane and sometimes across the plane. But Grisson and Pedicle never cross uh, intersectional segmental plane. You can understand because you see a nice demarcation line, um, dark side and the green side. So this is a V8 um, ventral, dosal. It's also going to be divided. So segment eight monosegmentectomy is now going to be completed. So you compare the shape of the area to, uh, to be resected with a preoperative simulation. And we confirm a hepatic reflow of a polar vein after a couple of times a grison uh, papering maneuver. It is, I think, important to check. Then we see a uh, you know, cut surface, exposed a right hepatic vein and a tumor, a resected specimen going to be removed in the plastic bag. Then you cut the tumor, the tumor is not secreting uh, endocyanin the green, then it's shining. So post-operative course is very nice. So this is a nice case. I think uh, we are still struggling to use a positive staining because it's technically difficult. And um, you know our negative staining is very much reproducible and consisting, so we prefer negative staining. And also, I'm still kind of skeptical about the tumor detection. This is a colorectal liver mat. Only three colorectal liver mats locate on the surface that you can see nicely, like ICG staining like this. But uh, if the tumor is inside, you cannot see. But you can probably use it for secure tumor margin. I've been showing this slide because I like, like it. The liver is an anatomical organ. But the problem is the most anatomical structures are invisible, hidden inside the parenchyma. When I visited the Quino's graves, it clearly shows that uh, hepatic vein runs along the intersectional plane or seg segmental plane or acrossing uh, those planes. But uh, Grison and Pedicle never across those uh, intersectional segmental planes. When you look up the skies beneath the trees, it is just like a Grusen and Pedicles. First branch of Grusen and Pedicles, second branch of Grusen and Pedicles. Those Grusen and Pedicles never cross each other. So you can divide intersectional or seg segmental planes like this. Professor Makuchi first described the limited anatomical resection because uh, he, treat, he treated the small hepatocellular carcinoma, but he found the quino segment area cannot be identified because there are no landmarks of the subsegment on the surface of the liver. That's why he started to inject the dye into the portal vein. One year later, Takasaki also described another way to uh, perform a small anatomic resection, like cone unit resection. The third order branch of a grison and pedicle, usually two, three cone units uh, uh, just uh, create one segment. So segment five, segment six, those monosegment uh, consists of two, three, four cone units. Anatomic resection can be uh, defined as a complete removal of the tumor bearing portal territory. And it can be also applied to the complete removal of third portal venous territories. Many papers have been published to show the benefit of anatomic resection over non-anatomic resection in short term and long term. Hepatocell carcinoma and it, it, even the colorectal liver meds and the recent important came out, um, paper came from um, Seoul National University, Hoson Hans Group, remnant liver ischemia, deteriorate a long-term survival. I think that this is uh, must be uh, true because uh, 
you know, information deteriorate the immune response and also the long-term survival. When I was a young surgeon, old surgeon told me that uh, if the patient uh, have uh, anastomotic leakage after gastrectomy or colectomy, patient recurs faster. This case was our first case of uh, limited anatomical resection. Hepatic cell carcinoma located uh, centrally, so uh, we have to perform a central bisectionectomy, but uh, remnant uh, liver function is not good. So indocinin green retention test was over 25%. So when we look at the DICOM data and uh, realize that uh, we can preserve posterior uh, dosal side of uh, anterior section. So we decided to perform a medial sectionectomy with ventral anterior sectionectomy. This is a resected specimen, large cellular carcinoma, it, but it looks like any creation of a tumor, but this is anatomic resection with nice margin, but limited um, um, amount of uh, normal parenchyma. We've been doing this type of surgery for the last several years, so we name it as a parenchyma sparing anatomic liver resection. We published uh, 86 consecutive cases last year. Our technique are very much standardized. Preoperative simulation, we measure volume of uh, each seg segment or e each cone unit, and we identify the portal vein, which in charge for the tumor bearing area. Uh, during the surgery, we try to find the portal vein in charge for the tumor bearing area. Then we always clamp from the hyla plate on the clamp those vein, the grison pedicle from the hyla plate, grison approach. Operation was very much standardized. We routinely use a ICG negative staining to see a clear margin of uh, ischemic area and non ischemic area. We also respect the Lenac capsule to perform grison approach from the hyla plate. During the surgery, we also uh, refer the wet, the branching where to clamp, but also uh, we compare the shape of the area to be resected. We uploaded the four video clips into this link. Even you don't, uh, you have no subscri uh, subscription of Anas of Surgery, uh, you can visit their link to see those four video clips. We appreciate um, quality of uh, camera improved. This is the latest version of uh, uh, camera. Then you can clearly visualize the demarcation, uh, verge, uh, demarcation plane between segment eight ventral and segment eight dorsal. So what you have to do is just to try to find the appropriate plane you, uh, referring this uh, shining green area and no shining green area. That's uh, intersegmental sectional plane. Intersegmental sectional plane only hepatic vein exists. Hepatic vein runs across the uh, cut surface or acrossing uh, uh, borders. Same thing and um, intersegmental plane only uh, hepatic vein runs and sometimes acrossing the intersectional segmental plane or running along the intersegmental sectional plane. So this is a V6, it's now going to be a staple divided. Then you can uh, just using a ligature to divide intersectional segmental plane because there's only hepatic veins exist, not grison and pedicle, including a bile duct, will never exist that appropriate intersegmental sectional plane. I think uh, this is uh, kind of a whole new uh, concept of a liver resection, in my opinion and in my mind. So segment six, more segmentectomy will be completed. So another case, collect the liver meds, uh, three metastases uh, are located two, eight, and five. 
And two eight are very much easy to uh, perform wedge resection, but this five locates a little bit deeper. So we decided to perform a segment five monosegmentectomy that consists, which consists of uh, three core unit, green, yellow, red. Green is a, a cranial side, red is a caudal side. So we identify three, five, G5, uh, three, G5, and also uh, we refer the shape of this area to be resected. So we routinely perform a Grissonet approach, I mean a Pringle maneuver. Then the anterior trunk is taken. As you see, I don't mind breaking a parenchyma to take a Grissonet approach, to take an anterior trunk. It's better not to break a Grissonet pedicle rather than breaking a parenchyma. So I'm using a CUSA to visualize a G5. I think this is a main G5. And the pre-operation it was in, uh, a, I think, a yellow. So this was clipped and double clipped with hemolock and metal clip and divided. And the anterior trunk was clamped so that we can visualize a plane between five and four. So we, we open up a country line, five and four, to approach a G5, locates a deeper from the hyla plate. So as you can see, this is very nice, clear margin, uh, the marcation area inside the parenchyma. So um, anterior trunk, blue dog was removed. Then I found uh, G5, locates deep inside parenchyma. So this is another G5, caudal side of a G5. It also uh, taped and divided. So we know we have uh, three G5 to be ligated and then divided. So it was divided. Then now we can uh, approach a G5 deeply located inside, then it was taped, and I place a bulldog clamp, and again, i ask an anesthetologist to give a 0 0.5, another 0 0.5 ICG per body. Then we're gonna see a clear margin between uh, segment five and eight after reperfusion. I think this is very nice. It is very difficult to define segment five and eight border but uh, when you use ICG like this way, you can clearly see a margin between five and eight, and this is a margin between five and six. So I recommend to perform a superficial parenchymal transection along the area to be resected. As you can see on your right side, uh, shining green is uh, segment eight. On your left side, Dark side is a uh, no green is a uh, segment five. So this is a uh, margin between segment five and eight. And the hepatic vein running along the intersectional segment of plane or sometimes are crossing a uh, intersectional segment of plane. This is a uh, last G5 uh, located, located the cranial side is now clipped and divided. This is a peripheral right hepatic vein. It's a uh, running uh, along the segment six. And again, the border between segment uh, six and eight, uh, six and five and five and eight is now clearly visualized. And some, sometimes those small veins are crossing uh, intersectional intersegmental plane. So this is very much a precise anatomic resection of segment five which consists of a three cone unit. So segment five monosegmentectomy is complete. So this is my team. We perform uh, 1,500 GI surgery a year, including uh, 400 cases of H HPV surgery. I always, I'm always thankful to my team. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Bukabachi. That was a phenomenal talk, actually. A phenomenal use of technique, technology, and your wisdom over the years, actually, that has led to those safe dissections. Uh, one of the okay. questions from the participants, actually, we just take a minute of yours, is mm -hmm. you know, uh, how often and when do you inject this ICG when you're doing this dissection? What is the timing of injection of this ICG? Uh, because I'm using ICG as a negative staining technique, so after I, after we clamp the grison and pedicle, uh, usually from the hyla plate, then I ask anesthesiologist to IV inject ICG 0.5 milligram per body. Okay. Uh, and uh, the images seem to be phenomenal. You're operating even when you're operating in the infrared mode. Uh, which system uh, of uh, the laparoscopic system do you use for this? Well, um, I think um, three those company create a, a you know ICG camera is commercially available from Olympus mm -hmm. and uh, Stoltz and Striker and the both. So you can choose uh, any of these. I know. Yeah, I know you're using the Olympus system. Actually, that is one of the best systems available. Actually, that gives that uh, green contrast is very phenomenal. Actually. And there is some data that is coming up to show that the green contrast is better than the other part. I'm not pretty sure, but there is some data. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor mm -hmm. Bakabayashi, for that phenomenal lecture. Thank I you. Think we'll, uh, we'll get some questions, actually, which we'll email to you, actually, part of this thing, actually. Uh, I'd be very happy if you could uh, reply to some of these queries that yep. are raised by the youngsters. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to tell you, we're going to host a consensus meeting next week, Tuesday. I give information, you can join, you can participate for free. Please join us to learn more about anatomical, um, you know, resection of the liver and also pancreas as well. Thank you very much for kind invitation again. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bakabashi, for the, to this thing actually. And we'll certainly join your, I'd certainly circulate your uh, teaser among our circles so that more and more people can get uh, benefited by this uh, talk. Thank you so much once again. Uh, from that, actually, we go on to the next speaker, uh, Professor Ishizawa, actually, actually, a uh, very well-known figure. Uh, he is basically from the University of Tokyo, heads the Department of Reputability Pancreatic Surgery. He's had some extensive uh, uh, experience with laparoscopic liver resections, and is also one of these users of ICG and infrared technology during liver resections. And as Professor Vakabashi has shown you, this is one modality that seems to be changing the entire concept of laparoscopic surgery. It is becoming more safer with the use of ICG. And it is not, it is more an objective evidence to show where you're going rather than a subjective evidence which you used to go by initially. So this is turned objective right now. And we have Professor Ishizawa who is going to tell us about this use of infrared laparoscopy and use of ICG. Now, as you've seen, if, you, if you've seen in our own data that we got from the surgeons across India and Asia Pacific region, some people, about 40% of the people are aware of this technology. Rest of them are not aware or they're not aware of this use in liver surgery. So we thought we'd have a detailed uh, uh, talk by Professor Ishizawa as to how ICG can be used how much can be used, and how is it used in laparoscopic liver resections? Professor Isizawa, thank you so much once again for being part of this webinar. Hello, everyone. And can you see my slide? Yes, yes. And can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much again. And thank you, Professor Shirikande, and Professor Rao, and Professor Jagana. And I'm glad to give a talk about the roles and limitations of NIR imaging in the field of HPV surgery. ICG fluorescence imaging is based on the fact that protein-bound ICG emits fluorescence signals under illumination by near-infrared light. This technique came into use in the field of HPV since the, uh, the epoch-making article by Professor Aoki in 2008 reporting a use of fluorescence imaging for identification of hepatic segmental boundaries. Recently, ICG fluorescence imaging has widely been used for crown geography, tumor identification, hepatic segmentation, 
and assessment of organ perfusion. In our department, I originally tried to apply ICG fluorescence imaging to current geography by intrabiliary and then intravenous injection of ICG. This would be the first report of laparoscopic chronography uh, cr cr with, a, uh, sorry, laparoscopic cholecystectomy with the use of intraoperative chronography by intravenous injection of ICG. And since then, a lot of surgeons in the world have reported a use of fluorescent chronography in laparoscopic or robot assisted cholecystectomy in totally more than uh, 3,000 cases. Indeed, is efficacy of this technique have also demonstrated by randomized control trials in which detect detectability of the, the extrahepatic bile duct anatomy is evaluated as compared with white light color imaging and conventional radiographic chronography. As a result, a use of fluorescent chronography in lab core has partly been recommended in the latest multi society guideline for prevention of bile duct injury. One of the major limitations of this technique is insufficient detectability of the bile duct due to limited tissue permeability, especially in the case of severe cholecystitis. But even in such situation, fluorescent chronography can work effectively when used in a step-by-step -step fashion. For example, this is the case of the very severe cholecystitis, so or the at the first stage, the fluorescent imaging could not, cannot detect any fluorescent signals uh, emitted from the bile duct. But after the dissection of the uh, adhesions, uh, the, the, we can find a very weak fluorescent signals probably emitted from the common hepatic duct here. So we can divide the fistula between the gallbladder and the duodenum. And after that, the fluorescent imaging can be used again and again to visualize the common hepatic duct here. And this would be the, the root of the cystic duct. So or the, finally, the uh, Kellogg's triangle can be dissected safely. And fluorescence imaging can be a very good navigation for the identification of the common hepatic duct here and the cystic duct here. Because of the very severe adhesion, the ICG cannot be a, cannot go into the uh, gallbladder. So gallbladder itself is negative for fluorescent signal, but we can see the conference between the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct. And this is the other side of the chiral triangle. This is the cystic duct. So finally, we can encircle the cystic duct safely. High, high fluorescent signal in the background liver is another factor which can decrease detectability of the bile duct. In order to organ sufficient signal to background ratio, a small amount of ICG should be injected long before the injection, the surgery. For example, uh, IV injection of ICG at dose of 2.5 milligram, 19 minutes prior to surgery, or 0 0.25 milligram per kilo ICG on the day before surgery may be effective. Another solution would be a, a direct injection of ICG solution into the biliary tract in a patient with a preoperative biliary drainage tube placement. Uh, this is the case with a uh, preoperative, uh, who had a uh, preoperative biliary drainage, the ENBD tube. So we can inject ICG solution into the biliary tract using the ENBD tube. And this patient also, the, the uh, cystic duct itself is negative for fluorescent signals because of the uh, stones uh, occluding the cyst cystic duct. So we cut the uh, cystic duct and to, to remove the stones closing the cystic duct. After the removal of these stones, that we can confirm the good passage of the bile juice through the uh, cystic duct here. And finally, we can close the cystic duct safely at that point without any sludge or uh, stones. So the cholecystectomy can be completed safely. This is the uh, second indication of ICG fluorescent imaging. 
to be honest, the application of ICG fluorescence imaging for tumor identification by ICG fluorescence imaging was a kind of byproduct of fluorescence chronography. One day in the case of hepatectomy with the use of chronography, I found by chance that a nodule of hepatocellular carcinoma emitted fluorescence signals from before intraoperative administration of ICG for chronography. I couldn't see the reason at first, but after seeing a lot of similar cases, I started thinking that the tumor was identified by fluorescence imaging because of the accumulation of the ICG that had been injected a couple of days before surgery, because in our department, all patients underwent ICG retention test by intravenous injection of ICG as a part of routine preoperative estimation of liver function. In fact, on the cut surfaces of resected specimens, fluorescent signals of ICG were identified in cancerous tissues of well or moderately differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma. In contrast, in poorly differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma and colorectal liver mets, the cancerous tissues were negative for fluorescence, fluorescence but ring-like fluorescent signals could be observed in hepatic parenchyma surrounding the tumor. In the subsequent studies, we revealed mechanistic background of ICG accumulation in and around the hepatic tumors. To put it simply, in differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma tissues, portal uptake transporters are still active so that ICG can be taken up into cancer cells. However, because of biliary excretion disorders due to cancer progression, washout of ICG is significantly delayed as compared with non-cancerous hepatic parenchyma, leading to the accumulation of ICG in the tumor at the time of surgery. In contrast, in poorly differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma and colorectal liver meds, the portal uptake transporters are not active, which means that ICG cannot be taken up into cancer cells and retains in non-cancerous hepatic tissues surrounding the tumor, probably because of biliary stasis due to compression or immature hepatocytes with delayed biliary excretion in precancerous regions as suggested by Professor Vermeyer's group in the Netherlands. Anyway, regardless of the fluorescence patterns, we can use fluorescence imaging for intraoperative identification of primary or metastatic liver tumors if ICG was injected intravenously within a couple of weeks before surgery. We have used ICG at a dose of 0.5 milligram per patient body weight because we have to use ICG for calculation of ICG retention test at 50 minutes at the preoperative liver function test. The major advantage of this technique is high feasibility and sensitivity. On the other hand, fluorescence imaging has limitations in relatively high false positive rate and limited tissue permeability. Therefore, when you find new regions without preoperative diagnosis by fluorescence imaging, additional resection of the regions should be considered only when malignancy is suspected by the other diagnostic modalities such as palpation, IOUS, US, or re-evaluation of preoperative imaging. Limited tissue permeability up to about eight millimeters from hepatic surfaces is another limitation. I believe that, however, we can use this technique effectively for confirmation of surgical margins by obtaining fluorescence images from hepatic raw surfaces during hepatectomy procedures, as well as identification on hepatic surfaces before dissection, especially in the setting of laparoscopic surgery where surgeons cannot palpate hepatic surfaces for intraoperative diagnosis of the tumor. As suggested in our previous report on fusion fluorescence imaging on of liver tumors during laparoscopic hepatectomy. I'd like to show you some clinical cases. This is the case of liver meds after very effective preoperative chemotherapy. So surgeons cannot identify the location of the tumor even with the use of contrast enhanced ultrasound. But fluorescence imaging uh, can identify the location of the tumor based on the uh, changes, biliary stasis around the tumor uh, very sensitively. So surgeons can remove this very tiny tumor with a minimal uh, hepatic resection like this. This is the other case of the liver meds and we can confirm the location of the tumor. So 
This technique is very useful to set the uh, hepatic transaction line like this. And hepatic parenchyma is transected. And I use fluorescence imaging not only from the hepatic surfaces, but also from the raw surfaces of the liver uh, to confirm the surgical margins. In this case, no fluorescence signals can be seen from the raw surfaces of the liver because the tumor margin is more than uh, one centimeter. But how about this case? This is the case of liver met. So we can see here the subcapsular sub tumor located in segment four and the hepatic parenchyma is transected. I'm trying to preserve this G4 inferior branch and ICD fluorescence imaging used again. And here we can see the uh, strong fluorescence signals emitted from outside of the uh, tumor. So this signal cannot, is not meaning that the uh, tumor exposure, but uh, we have to, uh, dissect hepatic parenchyma uh, more deeply to avoid hepatic uh, tumor exposure, sorry. And the fluorescence imaging is used again. This is the tumor from the hepatic surfaces. And this is the tumor signal uh, identified from the raw surfaces of the liver. So the hepatic transsexual line should be this line. And this is the uh, hepatic raw surfaces after the extended recession of the segment four. In the segmental surgical treatment of liver cancers, it is important to complete anatomic recession of hepatic segments accurately to reduce complications such as bile leak and ischemia of the remnant liver. Especially in the case of hepatocellular carcinoma, anatomic segmentectomy can eradicate potential cancer spread along the portal system, leading to the better long-term outcomes than non-anatomic hepatectomy as demonstrated in the previous articles. In order to identify boundaries of hepatic segment to be removed, the conventional dye staining technique has widely been used. According to the original technique first developed by Press Makuchi, hepatic segmental boundaries can be visualized as bluely stained areas by injection of indigo calamine directly into the tumor bearing segments under ultrasound guidance. Takasaki's Grisonia approach is another technique enabling identification of hepatic segment as ischemic regions of the liver following closure of the uh, inflow at the hepatic hilum. One day in 2011, during my stay in Paris as a fellow, I asked my mentor, Professor Gaye, to apply ICG fluorescence imaging for repro uh, reproducing Makuchi and Takasaki's classic techniques in his clinical cases of laparoscopic hepatectomy. And it was a real surprise that he did it in the next couple of weeks. Later, uh, we reported these techniques using a term positive and negative staining to indicate Makuchi and Takasaki's conventional technique, respectively. This is the final uh, first case of the positive staining by Professor Gaye. Uh, he's a genius of surgery, so he can easily pass the wrong needle uh, inserted from outside of the patient abdominal cavity to, to pass this small hole made on the outer sand probe to puncture this small branch of segment four, leading to the uh, good visualization of the segment four to be removed. Recently, I have learned to reproduce the Gaia's technique. And this is my case of hepatectomy segment six. And so this one branch of segment six is punctured and indigo calming with ICG is injected. So this medial part of the segment six is nicely identified both by a classic technique and also fluorescent imaging. And this is the uh, second branch of segment six, lateral branch. And this is the uh, outer sound image and ICG solution is injected and this lateral side is very clearly identified by fluorescence imaging. So we are going to remove these two small regions of the liver to complete the anatomic resection of the liver. A trick of hepatic segmentations with sub sufficient signal to background ratio is to use very small amount of ICG, which can prevent increase of fluorescence signals in the surrounding hepatic 
regions by re-entry of outflow ICG into the river. Although puncture of the uh, portal, portal branch in the laparoscopic setting is still technically demanding, a lot of surgeons mainly in urgent countries start using this positive staining technique in their clinic, class, uh, clinical cases and with some technical modifications to facilitate the function of the portal vein as presented by uh, Professor Aoki. They puncture the portal branch from outside of the uh, patient abdominal cavity uh, during the uh, same operation, operation, oper operation procedures. When the root of the uh, portal pedicle is accessible, the negative staining technique is technically easier than the positive staining technique. For example, this is the uh, resection of the segment three. So we can easily close the branch of segment three prior to the tran hepatic uh, parenchyma transection. And ICG is injected intravenously during surgery, leading to the very clear demarcation between segment two and three in this case. So, Surgeons can confirm the good hepatic transection planes, even during the parenchyma transection, as presented nicely by Professor Wakabayashi previously. And this is the other side of the river. So the landmark hepatic veins appears on the raw surfaces of the river. And finally, the root of the G3 is divided to complete the hand infestation of segment three. After the spread of fluorescence imaging in the laparoscopic setting, these techniques are getting attention again in open hepatectomy. This latest imaging system launched in Japan in this year enables projection of fluorescence images to open surgical fields, which may enhance feasibility of fluorescence imaging during open hepatectomy. Lastly, please let me introduce perfusion assessment. This technique is basically very easy, only needs intravenous bolus injection of ICG. This is the case of the pancreatic cancer invading to the uh, common hepatic artery and also splenic artery. So we are uh, going to perform the modified DP car surgery, uh, preserving the uh, left gastric artery and also the GDA, uh, liver hepatic flow from the uh, GDA. So this is the uh, photo of the, uh, during the surgery. The common hepatic artery is clamped at this level and this is the, also the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, common, he common hepatic artery after dividing the uh, left gastric artery. Then ICG is injected intravenously. And fluorescence imaging clearly visualize the good flow from the GDA to the uh, proper hepatic artery here. And also the uh, good arterial flow uh, from the left gastric artery is confirmed. So we, uh, uh, we can divide the arteries at this level safely, preserving the blood flow to the liver and the stomach. This is the state after the DP car procedure. This slide summarizes approval, approval status of the uh, applications of ICG fluorescence imaging in Japan. While the use of ICG for intraoperative perfusion assessment and subsequent visualization of hepatic segments have approved by the National Health Insurance System that for chorangiography and tumor identification are still in the category of off-label use. In order to use ICG fluorescence imaging more widely and effectively, we need more evidence to create consensus. And RCT is, of course, a gold standard to produce high-level evidence, but it is often difficult to apply this it's study designed to evaluation of uh, interoperative diagnostic techniques like fluorescence imaging. Recently, we have established the, the International Society for Fluorescence Guided Surgery, ISFGS, aiming to enhance communication between surgeons, researchers, and industry beyond specialties, and trying to create consensus with the use of Delphi method and ideal st staging system. So I'd like to ask you all to use ICG fluorescence imaging techniques actively in your clinical practice and report its efficacy and limitations using the framework of ISFGS. And in addition to the ICG-based fluorescence imaging, I'd like to introduce you upcoming techniques of intraoperative fluorescence imaging. In our department, we are developing novel fluorescence probes for visualization of pancreatic juice leakage and adenocarcinoma tissues. This is new probe designed to visualize the pancreatic juice 
This probe is activated by pancreatic chemotropic organ. This is the peak BP model, and uh, the, the pancreas is divided with a stapler, and this probe is played on the directly on the stump of the uh, pancreas. And here we can see the pancreatic juice leaking from the uh, stump of the uh, main pancreatic duct uh, clearly by fluorescence image. This is the, the other technique for the visualization of the adenocarcinoma tissues with the use of the uh, upregulation up of the uh, cancer specific uh, enzyme. And this probe is sprayed directly on the uh, resected specimen of the cholangio carcinoma, and blue light is eliminated, and the uh, yellow filter uh, is covered, and then we can see the uh, very high fluorescent signals emitted from the adenocarcinoma tissues. Uh, this is the uh, outcomes of the uh, fluorescence imaging with the use of this probe. And interestingly, the, this probe can discriminate the, the, the post-operative cause because this technique can visualize the uh, nature of the uh, active cancer tissues. Recently, more and more researchers and surgeons are developing varieties of novel cancer-specific fluorescence probes for example, the Netherlands group is conducting clinical trials for evaluating safety and efficacy of their new fluorescence probe targeting CEA expressed in the colorectal cancer and pancreatic cancer tissues. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, intraoperative fluorescence imaging can be used for real-time identification of the actual extent of cancer spread, anatomic variations, and accurate risk of post-operative complications in each indi individual patient, which may enable tumor uh, tailor-made surgery. And I believe that in near future, accumulation of fluorescence probe will be used not only for diagnosis, but also for active cancer treatment. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Professor Ishizawa. That was a beautiful exposition of the new technology that has made uh, laparoscopic liver surgery very safe. What has become an objective thing, actually, I mean, subjective thing now, it's more an objective evidence to show the outcomes have really improved. Actually, we've not shown, not only shown what is currently being used in laparoscopic uh, liver surgery, but also the future. There seems to be a lot of promise, actually, and uh, I mean, all those who are practicing laparoscopic HPV surgery should be very well aware of this ICG technology and the infrared technology because it is rapidly making road inroads into the management, uh, both qualitatively, quantitatively, and with uh, the introduction of artificial intelligence and more and more applications coming in, it is being also used as Professor Ishizawa showed in the pancreatic surgery also. Thank you so much, Akili, for that the beautiful uh, awareness talk on ICG. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from you again, Mrs. Java. Thank you once again uh, for that uh, lecture. And thank you on behalf of the hospitals and all of this. Uh, thank with you that, very much. With that, we take you on to the next talk. It is Professor, uh, Professor Vivek Witt, my friend from Fortis Hospital, who would be talking on the use of energy sources in uh, liver resection. Luckily, you all aware that luckily over the last two decades or so, the way liver is being resected from the crush clamp technique to the present day technique, actually a lot of techniques have evolved. Uh, each one swears by a procedure of his own, but ultimately we have some science to show that what is the best and what can be used in current day clinical practice based on the evidence. So I have Professor Vivek Witz with me, who is the chairman, director, of the Advanced Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences at Focus Hospital in Delhi, India, who is going to share his views about the various energy devices that are used in current day practice when we are introducing the liver resections. Uh, Professor Vivek. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rao. Uh, it's an, indeed, it's an honor and pleasure to come on this platform uh, which you have arranged. And after, uh, listening to the mesmerizing talks from Professor Wakabayashi and uh, Ishijawa. I like to, I try to do justice with my talk. Uh, at the outset, I would like to say that uh, primarily our, my work is in uh, living donor liver transplant, where uh, from my laparoscopic surgery experience comes. And presently, till now, we have completed about 72 uh, 
pure laparoscopic donor hepatectomies and i would like to start my talk by just sharing a small video uh, of <clears throat> energy usage uh, so let me share a video and from there i'll take my talk talk on so are you able to see my video yes yes yeah so so almost every kind of energy device is being used uh, in the liver parenchymal transaction liver mobilization so it is one of the surgeries i i feel where all kinds of surgical devices or energy devices have a role depending on the area we dissect so here we are using thunderbeat <clears throat> we can use harmonic scalpel we can use uh, uh, various kind of uh, vessel sealers to dissect as well as to as well as to do hemostasis so mobilization of right lobe again with an energy device and so much so that we uh, i feel that uh, laparoscopic surgery would not have been possible without these inventions of energy devices so use of hook use of sealers so <clears throat> mobilization of right lobe we can uh, go on not only for mobilization of the liver for the liver surgeries or segmental resections but also for also for parenchymal transaction because cusa is after all an energy source or energy device so proper use of cusa and sealers is must for parenchymal transaction as well so <clears throat> this is porta dissection and after temporarily clamping again we are using hook hook is a wonderful instrument to use if you use it properly in liver resections again thunderbeat harmonic all these instruments cusa the various kinds of cusas which are available in the market to be used uh, segment 5 s5 branch of the hepatic vein then again energy sources are used to divide the parenchyma <clears throat> i i feel energy sources uh, have made a tremendous difference in uh, laparoscopic liver resections because if if energy sources were not there i would not see the level of work being done in laparoscopic hepatobiliary surgery as well as living donor liver transplant again cordate can be divided with the energy sources we complete the transaction again with the energy sources so i i think more than 50 60% part of the liver any liver surgery is done with the help of energy sources so this is what i wanted to show you so i will stop here for video and uh, share my slides for my talk so <clears throat> the talk given to me today is energy devices in laparoscopic liver resections i feel that laparoscopic liver resection is a knowledge and which has accumulated over the time and every every knowledge which accumulates over the time has three components first is technology which is the most important component like dr wakabayashi and dr ishijawa talked about technology icg this is all technology Uh, until the wings of technology are there we will not be able to achieve what we have achieved in technology for liver resections we have now 3d scopes even flexible ones by olympus we have different kinds of energy sources we have icg we have vascular staplers we have laparoscopic cusa and very advanced surgical instruments to deliver a good outcome people are the most important the second most important where the training skills and teamwork matters and of course 
after having all this we need to set up the processes and protocols before we can embark on the journey of advanced laparoscopic liver resections wings of technology so uh, as i showed you in my video so for any kind of laparoscopic liver resection we should have different kinds of energy devices including cusa staplers um, monopolar sealers ultrasonic devices and many more so possibilities of lapro laparoscopic liver resection we have already seen we can do living donor liver transplant donor hepatectomy we have seen all the segmental beautiful segmental hepatectomies uh, anatomical procedures by professor wakabayashi and of course the pinnacle of everything is pure living donor liver transplant living donor hepatectomy which is a preservative surgery so i am talking today because energy sources although are the wings but correct uses of energy devices is mandatory is very important and it correct usage would deliver a good outcome and at the same point of time it would also prevent or decrease the morbidity by decreasing the injuries or the complications so correct usage desired effect of effect is improved outcomes correct uses of energy devices would definitely decrease the blood loss and air embolism they would also decrease conversions from laparoscopy to open surgery they would decrease the bile leaks they would decrease arterial dissection while dissecting arteries portal vein thrombosis and they would definitely go on to decrease the cost and length of stay if used properly energy devices uh, in laparoscopic liver surgery or for that sake simply can be divided into either hemostatic or sealers and a parenchymal transaction energy device so this is a simple classification of energy devices uh, for laparoscopic liver surgery uh, the source depending upon the source it can be a electro surgery or it can be a mechanical surgery but the only hybrid <coughs> energy device which is available is thunderbeat which is actually a combination of bipolar along with the ultrasonic energy so i i personally like uh, thunderbeat quite a lot because of these two two functions which are combined together for parenchymal transaction we have been using kelly kleisis for a long time which is also a kind of mechanical energy and now most of the surgeons in the world they use cusa which is a instant success uh, in defining the veins as well as pedicles in the liver other other devices are available like water jet active blade of harmonic and thunderbeat because in robotic surgery or robotic transaction we cannot use cusa because cusa is not available so we use harmonic uh, one active blade of the harmonic or thunderbeat so monopolar hook as i showed you in my video that hook can be used it it can be a wonderful in instrument to dissect as well as uh, divide the tissues but it has to be it has to come with a caution because it has lots of problems when it is used improperly overshooting is a problem you hook the structure you pull it and it overshoots stray currents are a problem if the if the insulation is not proper inadvert act, act, activation can lead to injuries and dispersive electro injuries can be there because it's a monopolar energy there are a lot of bipolar devices which are available in the market for laparoscopic liver surgery or laparoscopic surgery as such uh, these are the three most common <clears throat> bipolar devices uh, which have been used either it is ligasure uh, or aquamantis or enseal by uh, ethicon so uh, personally i don't use bipolar devices because i use thunderbeat which itself is inbuilt with a bipolar device as well as a harmonic uh, kind of energy now ultrasonic shears are very important uh, as an energy source for liver resections or laparoscopic liver surgery uh, this is uh, <clears throat> this is uh, harmonic scalpel uh, harmonic energy which thunderbeat as well as har harmonic scalpel uses so the basics of this is it converts the ac current into a mechanical energy with the help of piezoelectric ceramic disks which are amplified the, and this vibration is amplified with help of silicon nodes and this active there is a active jaw 
as well as there is a passive jaw we must be aware of these things while transacting the liver because active jaw if it comes in contact with the uh, important vital structures like ivc or hepatic veins or the or the uh, pedicles or porta hepatis then it can create injury which can manifest later on so this vibration uh, this oscillating jaw vibrates from 55 k hertz uh, and this vibration level this vi this 15 micro to 100 micron is the uh, excursion it goes in the frequency is 55000 hertz and it can ex have excursion of 15 micron to 100 micron now depending on the, and this is called as the low energy or high energy if we if it vibrates at 15 micron then it will produce more of the sealing effect coagulative effect but if it vibrates at 100 micron it will produce more of the cutting effect so when we use harmonic it's important to know that to seal or to coagulate we should we should use lower settings as well as if we want to just cut and divide we should use higher settings uh, for that that purpose now <clears throat> and there are two important factors when we seal the blood vessel or seal the structure inside of course uh, what is the structure we are sealing is very important because most of these devices are made for arteries or the major blood vessels which have lot of collagen as well as elastin in their in their wall when we uh, clamp these uh, vessels and apply these energy sources their coagulative necrosis happens and temperature remains between 60 to 100 and due to this coagulative necrosis it seals now this this is the fundamental if we use these devices for very thin veins then it becomes a problem usually they don't seal because they don't have any collagen or fibrin we should keep that in mind while transecting the liver uh, what i usually do is if i have to seal a, a small vein i leave a tissue liver tissue around it and then seal it another factor which is very important you must know what effect is desired if the effect of coagulation is more desired then of course don't put any tension or lift the uh, lift the instrument if we lift the instrument that will create the tension in in the structure to be divided and it will divide rather than coagulate so compression and lifting this thing should be remembered while doing the liver resection laparoscopically uh ceiling cutting devices thunder beat as i told you is a is a kind of um, a dual device where bipolar energy is used along with the harmonic energy it's a dual device and it also has a intelligent tissue monitoring where a temperature rises doesn't rise beyond a point and collateral damage is less as compared to other instruments organ plasma coagulation now uh, many laparoscopic surgeons uh, around the world uh, avoid using apc during the surgery laparoscopic surgery because of the risk of gas embolism as well as increased intra abdominal pressure but if used judiciously this can be of a great help uh, a low grade ooze from the surface can be controlled from the cut surface can be controlled either by bipolar energy or i routinely use organ plasma coagulation in pulses for just a, a few seconds one uh, uh, two seconds three second pulse to just keep the area dry if that can be used of course it it should not be used in the uh, around the major veins it should not be used around the cava because then of course the hole will enlarge and it the risk of gas embolism will go up cutting devices as energy devices qza is the most common cutting device used and the basic principle in, involved here is uh, the differential effect it produces on pedicles as well as the liver parenchyma a soft tissue it will dissect and cut and suck but the blood vessels as well as the pedicles it will leave as such in the parenchyma which later on can be clipped stapled depending on the situation and <clears throat> qza while using qza my choice is to keep qza at the lowest energy level possible which is around 30 to 40 and then keep on increasing if the liver is very hard uh, 
I keep the suction at around 60 to 70, as well as irrigation to the minimum of one to two. There are many papers published on comparison of various energy devices. Uh, and most of the time, harmonic scalpel with Sony Cision and Thunderbeat have been compared. But uh, the point here is Thunderbeat has maximum up to seven millimeter ceiling <clears throat> effect. It also has least lateral thermal energy. So along with its design of uh, blades, uh, it's, it's my preferred choice. So the most important thing is to prevent injuries. Division of parenchyma is one thing. Uh, taking out liver tumors is another thing. Now we have to, while using energy devices, we have to be very, very cautious that we don't create complications and those don't cause any injury. Now there, there's a there is a long uh, there there are many papers published on biliostasis or bile leaks uh, because while dividing the parenchyma if there is there are crossover pedicles and if we transect them with the energy devices whether it will produce more bile leaks or less bile leaks there is a controversial data about that but at present consensus is not to use energy devices for sealing the bile ducts as well as the pedicles holes in IVC of course uh, while mobilization we should be very cautious in using energy devices. Hepatic arterial intimal dissection can happen because if you use them improperly, that can cause injury to the intima. Major hepatic vein injury can, can happen if we don't dissect the hepatic veins properly and use energy source without looking at them. Late bleeds can also happen with the improper use of monopolar, which later on, uh, it, it forms a scar, which later on goes off and cause post-operative bleeding and damage to surrounding structures should be avoided. So there's a lot of experimental data uh, available on sealing of um, bile ducts as well as pedicles, but this is just an experimental data. I, I think at present we are not ripe enough to use energy source for bile ducts or pedicles inside the liver. So uh, <clears throat> my last two slides, um, we have been uh, struggling with our laparoscopic program for last one and a half years. And uh, as we all know, the stages of learning are uh, classically defined from unconscious incompetence where we don't know anything and we are in a denial mode that it cannot be done to conscious, unconscious competence where on at spinal level, we go and do the surgery. So uh, I think uh, a Japanese surgeon, Professor Wakabayashi and Ishijawa have shown that uh, anything is possible if we keep on trying, keep on trying and keep on trying. So with that thing in mind, we have uh, uh, designed our program and now we have completed 72 pure laparoscopic liver resections out of which 67 are right lobe, just two left lobes and four left lateral segments. So technology is useful servant, but a dangerous master. So it should be mastered and then used. That's what my take on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Vivek, uh, for that beautiful exposition of the different uses of energy sources. You have shown the, what is all the currently available, what are the limitations, where it should be used, where it should not be used. Thank you so much once again for giving us this time. Actually, I think we'll get some questions on the mail. We will, I think, they'll sure, directly. Sure, 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 sure. Yes, uh, please, please, please. Thank you so much once again for joining Pleasure. us. Pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, from this, actually, we go on to the next talk. Actually, this uh, is going to be an endoscopic talk. Uh, basically, talk by he happens to be the chairman of AAG Hospital. He's been the president of World Health, uh, World Endoscopy Organization. Uh, he received several awards because of his work in endoscopy, because of innovations, commitment, and advancement of endoscopy. And I think the pinnacle of this is actually his, uh, towards his contribution to the field of endoscopy. I think they've awarded him the Schindler Award from the American Society, which is one of the most prestigious awards uh, in endoscopy field. Uh, Dr. Reddy is known for his work in therapeutic endoscopy and research. He's had phenomenal uh, experience in phalangoscopy and is one of the people who is involved in the prototype evaluation of various endoscopes, phalangoscopes that are available in current clinical practice. Uh, we would like uh, Dr. Reddy to share his views of phalangoscopy We've been indirectly visualizing the biliary system, but now direct visualization of the bile net is possible. 
pre operatively. So we'll see, look at the advantages of using direct polyangioscopy versus the indirect visualization of the bile ducts and the intrahepatic ducts, uh, both before and uh, during surgery. So, Dr. Reddy from AG Hospital. Uh, so, can we share the recording, sir? <laughs> So can you see it? Yes. Okay. My topic is setting standard for cholangioscopy in 2021. For the last six decades, a major modality of treating patients with pancreatic or biliary disease has been ERCP. However, ERCP has several limitations, including the low yield for discriminating strictures and filling defects, the difficulty and time-consuming uh, problems in removal of difficult CBD stones, and of course, radiation exposure to patients and staff. Uh, to overcome these uh, challenges, uh, peripheral cholangioscopy was introduced a uh, few years back, but you can see historically that it took over 30 to 40 years for this to mature and develop the technology that we have now, a uh, single-use uh, spyglass uh, digital system. The use of cholangioscopy falls into three buckets, the diagnostics, which are, for example, indiscriminate strictures, therapeutics for difficult biliary stones, and of course, a variety of other indications. Let's look at these more closely. The main diagnostic indication for cholangioscopy at present is evaluation of indeterminate biliary strictures, especially to get tissues under direct control, delineation of intraductal tumor margins, and of course, to, him, to evaluate more difficult situations like hemobilia. When you look at biliary strictures like this radiographically, it's very difficult to say whether you're dealing with inflammatory, post-operative, or malignant. Uh, you can see that uh, they look alike when you're actually looking at them radiologically under ERCP. And of course, uh, ERCP's limitations are quite obvious from this meta-analysis, which showed that a sensitivity of even brushings and biopsies only reach about 45 to 48%. And therefore, we require better methods to discriminate these different types of strictures. And look at examples here. For example, this is a patient who has uh, strictures in the CBD, and both these patients have similar looking strictures and all of the investigations were negative. But when we did cholangioscopy, you can see very clearly that the stricture on the right was actually a tumorous lesion. Biopsies from this showed it to be a, a B-cell lymphoma. And the stricture on the right actually had caseous material coming out from this and this turned out to be a tuberculous stricture. And both of them could be treated uh, adequately just by medical means without resort to surgery. And again, you can see that Cholangioscopy's utility here in a patient who has an IgG4 cholangiopathy. Biopsies uh, with uh, IgG4 staining clearly showed this to be an IgG4 related cholangiopathy, and there was dramatic response to steroids, again showing the optimum outcome that can come out with using parallel cholangioscopy. This was a registry that we ran in the Asia Pacific regions, uh, multicentric one, 289 patients with indeterminate biliary lesions. And you can see that. Uh, the visual impression sensitivity was 87% with a fairly high degree of specificity and overall accuracy of 77%, suggesting that in patients with indeterminate biliary strictures, and cholangioscopy can definitely help us to improve outcomes. But what about using this as a primary modality? What happens in clinical practice? In most of these patients, we would first do an ERCP brushings and biopsies. Negative patients uh, would then be taken up for cholangioscopy. Uh, what about taking up these patients directly? This was a study we did along with uh, Horst Neuer's groups in uh, Germany and uh, James in Hong Kong. And you can see that these are 60 patients of indeterminate bilay structures, indeterminate by radiological imaging, randomized to ERCP and brushings versus cholangioscopy biopsy. And you can see very clearly that cholangioscopy was much superior in terms of sensitivity, overall accuracy, and of course, uh, the outcomes are much better when we did cholangioscopy directly when compared to uh, VRCP and brushing, showing clearly the superiority of cholangioscopic uh, visualization and biopsy. The other area where we are 
using this uh, is to delineate the tumor. For example, in a patient like this who has to go for extended right hepatectomy, the surgeon would want to know what is the extent of tumor involvement of the left hepatic duct. And you can see that using cholangioscopy, we can uh, now go directly into the smaller radicals because the, the single operator cholangioscope is quite flexible. And then we can actually go deep into this segment two here we're going into and then coming back and then segment uh, looking at this amount of duct that is left between uh, the main common hepatic duct and the tumor and you can see we have a margin of about uh, two centimeters which was enough for the surgeon to take on these patients for the extended right hepatic duct so the exact extent of the lesion can be mapped out very accurately with cholangioscopy now uh, and you can see the outcomes that have come from this type of mapping. You can see that the change in surgical plan occurred in 34% of the patients, either avoiding surgery or doing less or more extensive surgery. And I think this is a very useful um, uh, anatom anatomical landmarks that a surgeon often asks for. What are the therapeutic indications? The main therapeutic indication for cholangioscopy is difficult intraductal stones uh, that... Of course, we also can use it for targeted cannulation of complex structure and so on. But the most important indication happens to be difficult CBD stones. And you can see examples of difficult CBD stones here, stones above structures, Merzis syndrome, multiple large stones, and sometimes even intrahepatic stones like this, which are very difficult to remove by conventional ERCP uh, techniques can be removed using cholangioscopy. And uh, of course, we can do either a cholangioscopy laser-directed therapy or EHL in some cases to break these very complex uh, stones. Um, the efficacy of this parallel cholangioscopy for intraductal retrocision has been shown by this meta-analysis, uh, which looked at a large number of uh, patients, and you can see an overall uh, fragmentation success of 91%. Single-session fragmentation, 76, with a fairly low adverse events, and most of these adverse events were in form of cholangitis, which could be treated with antibiotics. Now, how does this compare with standard techniques? And this was a study which came from Los Angeles, which looked at patients with uh, large CBD stones, randomized them into the standard therapy, including balloon dilatation, mechanical lithotripsy, or standard cholangioscopy guided lithotripsy. And you can see the success rates with cholangioscopy guided lithotripsy was 93%, much lower with the standard techniques. And majority of these patients actually had to go for surgery without much difference in adverse effects. And therefore, I think, uh, shows the superiority of cholangioscopy guided therapy in these patients. Uh, from Sham Vardhanu's group, we have another study which actually randomized patients uh, with the large stones, uh, which exceeded the diameter of extrahepatic biliary duct. These, these patients were randomized to either using a standard cholangioscopy with lithotripsy or using the standard method of balloon dilatation followed by uh, extraction of these stones. And you can see again very clearly higher success rates with uh, cholangioscopic laser lithotripsy. Uh, what about those patients in whom the standard balloon extraction fails? That is, you do a balloon dilatation followed by extraction of the stones, and then mechanical lithotripsy was compared with laser lithotripsy by the group from Thailand. And you can see very clearly that uh, laser lithotripsy was superior to mechanical lithotripsy in these patients. So if you have a patient who has a failed stone extraction following balloon dilatation of uh, the spinter, the way to go about is to do uh, a cholangioscopy and laser lithotripsy in these patients. Intrahepatic stones, as I told you, are more difficult to extend. And you can see here uh, these stones, which are actually stuck in the left hepatic uh, duct in segment three and two. And uh, we can, of course, pass this uh, very flexible cholangioscopes into these ducts. Flushing out with uh, water, we can try and get these stones down to tackle them. But the stones which are actually impacted, we can use uh, EHL, like in this case, or a laser. And you can see EHL being used to fragment the stones which are associated with strictures to completely small fragments, and then this can be removed. There are, of course, further indications for cholangioscopy. For example, uh, radiation-free removal of bile duct stones may become one of the most important future indications. Removal of migrated stents in these patients can also become important. And, of course, uh, when we use radiofrequency ablation for intraductal tumors, we can actually check cholangioscopically whether this process has been completed or not. 
Radiation is, of course, one of the major problems with the conventional ERCP, and very often both the staff and the patient is exposed to this radiation. And in some situations, for example, in a pregnant patient, uh, this can become quite detrimental. So we are now starting to use radiation-free cholangioscopic extraction of these uh, stones. And this is an example of a pregnant patient who underwent uh, ERCP for a stone in the bile duct. And you can see here, we're not using radiation. This patient undergoes a spintrotomy and followed by a insertion of cholangioscope into this. And then, of course, when we see the stone in this case, uh, we use specialized baskets which can be passed through the cholangioscope and the stone can be caught and removed without uh, uh, radiation at all in, in, in this whole procedure. Uh, after, the, after the stone is extracted, we can go back with the cholangioscope check the whole extent of the bile duct to see that uh, they are free from any stones. I think this is another area, a very exciting area where cholangioscopy is going to be used more and more in future, radiation-free therapies in these patients. Of course, in sometimes when you have very tortuous uh, anatomy, um, putting in guide wires either selectively into left and right hepatic ducts can be difficult. In these types of cases, precise steering and additional support for flexible wire is provided by cholangioscope. And you can see an example here. The guide wire is coiling all the time. We can't get it inside. Using a cholangioscope directed guiding, we can actually guide it very carefully into the right hepatic ductal system. Another area where developments are occurring is to use this, instead of using this cholangioscope orally in anatomy, which is very difficult, or in patients in post-operative situation where you don't have access to the papilla and the bile ducts, we can actually do a percutaneous cholangioscopy. And the new spyglass discover system is extremely useful in this situation. Uh, for example, this is a very short cholangioscope, and we have found in our practice, once the radiologist gives us a track, we can insert this and do all types of procedures. It's extremely useful. And this is the first report uh, by Horst Neuhaus unit uh, where um, in a patient who had complex stones and inability to reach the papilla, a percutaneous uh, spy scope, the spy discover has been used. And you can see because of the size of diameter of the scope, which is very thin, it can be easily inserted to the tract. And once the stones are visualized, uh, these can be pulverized using the standard techniques, either EHL or laser. Uh, we can study the whole system, of course, inject contrast to look at uh, the bile duct. And once the stones are completely pulverized using a EHL, the stones can be pushed through the papilla into the intestines. And of course, um, uh, the channel in this is uh, similar to 1.2 as we have in the standard spy scope. And you can see how the stones can be nicely fragmented completely. And then these small fragments can be pushed through the normal papilla down. Of course, uh, using cholangioscopy can be quite expensive and expenses can vary depending on which country you're practicing in. But this was an uh, economic impact model which was presented by the Belgium group, uh, which looked at uh, what is the economic impact of cholangioscopy when compared with uh, a normal ERCP. And you can see here, they've actually shown very clearly that in stricture diagnosis, especially indeterminate stricture, by using cholangioscopy upfront, you can decrease the number of procedures by 31%, cost by 5%. In stone therapy, again, using cholangioscopy upfront, you can decrease the number of procedures, you don't have to repeat the procedure, you can decrease the number of procedures by 27% and the cost by 11%. I think this is significant economic impact that we are starting to see. Of course, cholangioscopy has complications, especially uh, by adding cholangioscopy to ERCP or increasing the complication rate by at least 5%. And the most important of these complications is cholangitis because you're filling the system with uh, saline. So one has to be careful not to over distend uh, the biliary system to avoid this problem of cholangitis. The other complications like pancreatitis, perforation and all can occur even with standard ERCP. But many of these complications can be decreased with uh, more expert operators and of course realizing the dangers that can occur with overfilling the system. So in conclusion, the um, cholangioscopy that we're using now on single operator cholangioscopy is a technology of choice because of its easy application for a variety of indications. And of course, we now have a lot of data to suggest its efficacy, especially in patients with indeterminate uh, biliary strictures. And of course, it's very effective for selected patients with ERCP failure for difficult 
biliary stones. It also allows complex radiation-free intervention in patients, for example, with migrated stents in patients with uh, in pregnancy, for example, doing interventional procedures like, say, removing stones and so on. So I think um, cholangioscopy has a great future, and it's another armamentarium in patients uh, uh, who have complex pancreatic or biliary disorders. Uh, it definitely adds to our standard ERCP. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Reddy, for that uh, great talk, actually, on the use of cholangioscopy and how it is making inroads into the management of pancreatic biliary diseases. Uh, I think as a part of this, actually, I'll, uh, what, what has happened in the recent times is actually we have seen more and more use of endoscopy in surgery. Uh, so... So, intraoperative uh, endoscopy in current day GI practice, actually, and it has shown that intraoperative endoscopy has significantly improved the outcomes of different procedures. It has been used not only extensively, both for foregut colorectal surgery and also pancreatic surgery, and it is shown that it is definitely improving outcomes. So intraoperative endoscopy is becoming a separate specialty by itself. And as in today, if you look at this in the hepatobiliary surgery, the bile imaging conventionally is basically by ultrasound, CD, or MR, endoscopic ultrasound, PTC, or an intraoperative angiogram, or an ERCP, or what has been shown earlier by the use of indigo cyanine gene. This is how we indirectly visualize the bile duct. But we've been talking about this direct cholangioscopy, and we've borrowed this idea from the endoscopy. So we've shown that parodal cholangioscopy can be a big advantage for patients with hepatobiliary problems. And as you said, actually, if you can extrapolate this like the other endoscopic fields to see if this can be used intraoperatively, both anti-grade and retrograde, to see if it can be used to improve the outcomes of surgery. Now, initially available scopes were very thick. And the maneuverability was a big problem, but the currently available scope, which are very thin, very maneuverable, uh, these have come into clinical practice and with absolutely very good vision. These uh, new scopes that are available, that are predominantly used on the endoscopy side, but they can be extrapolated, used on the surgical side. And as been shown by Dr. Reddy, the shorter versions of these scopes are not av now available in clinical practice with the same set of accessories which can be used for both benign and malignant diseases. So there, is lot, there has been a lot of data which is in the big, uh, earlier to show the use of these scopes intraoperatively for management of various benign and malignant diseases. But again, as I told you, the limitation was the size of the scopes and accessories that are available and the expertise that is available among the surgeons. But if you extrapolate this, if you start using cholangioscopy intraoperatively, it can be used both for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. It can be used for visualization and optically guided biopsies of intermediate biliary strictures and dominant strictures in primary sclerosing cholangitis and intraductal papillary neoplasms. It can precisely map out intraductal cholangiocarcinomas. You can pick up skip lesions and then you can mark out the site of resections also. And as I told you, it can be used for stone extraction of the benign diseases, for stone fragmentation, maybe retrieval of those migrated stones. On the benign side, actually, it has been extensively used for treatment of uh, stones. Actually, we are all aware of this uh, cholangioscope that is used. Actually, we have different types of cholidoposcope that are used, uh, either passed through the cystic duct or through the, through the cholidopotomy for retrieval of the common bile duct stones. This has been an alternative to the conventional endoscopic approach, and there is a lot of data in the literature to show that if you are, I mean, using this armamentarium and this equipment, ideally, the results of a single stage procedure, that is, doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and bile duct exploration at the same time, seem to be equal efficacy or maybe superior as far as the financial scene is concerned. And there's a lot of data to show that both the procedures are superior and it is you know, equally effective. But a single stage procedure could be more cheaper if you have good expertise uh, with 
during the departure. So, but you extrapolate the same thing onto the management side. This is one situation with a uh, protocol sys with uh, IPMN, which was picked up actually. Now, this patient was taken up to surgery. You can see this is a cross sectional imaging. This will dissect it out the lower end of the bile duct, then tape this entire thing, make sure there was no spillage of this content of the bile duct into the peritoneal cavity. You can see this, we've got the stay sutures, make sure that the entire thing was protected. You can see this entire area is protected. And subsequently, you pass this short digital scope. You can see this, these are the beautiful images of trans elimination of the bile duct. You can very clearly see the bile duct, the extension. And if you see what happens is, you see this, these are very clearly to show that the right left ductal systems are clear and the tumor is falling short of the high. So here we're able to make sure that intraoperatively we are able to do a digital spy, identify the lesion, make sure that the proximal ductal system is free and also go into the right left hepatic ducts to make sure that you're not missing any more skip lesions. And once you do this, actually then subsequently we see this is the tumor proximally that is uh, distal, you can see that's in the bile duct. And what I've shown is the intrahepatic ducts at the confluence. Once you've done this, actually then, uh, see this is how you go in, check, make sure that you check the ducts, absolutely clear. You go into the right duct, left ducts separately, make sure that there are no skip lesions. Once this is done, then you can make sure that you resect this uh, tumors, and then subsequently, even after doing the thing, you can again go back into the right duct of system, make sure they're not, not making any skip lesion. This is the specimen after the procedure. This is another such patient with the IPMN in the bile duct. Actually, you can see this completely dissected out, and then subsequently, we do this phalangoscopy. Now, this is the tumor here. Then we go proximally, and you can see this. The tumor is absolutely localized to this. Uh, both the ductals, right left ductal systems are free. Then we go inside, make sure that we flush out everything, make sure you're not missing any other lesion and subsequently. So this is one, one very useful and the biggest advantage is the trans elimination and the uh, micro forces that are available can be used to take some pinch biopsies from suspected lesions even within the ducts and they can always change the line of management. And as Dr. Reddy has shown you that there is definitely there is change in line of management of a good percentage of patients whenever we do these procedures intraoperatively. And you can see this once you've done this, we are transecting this, make sure that the tumor is, this margins are clear. We take whole section mark. This thing from the resected radius, both the right and the left ducts here, do a cholangiogram and also do a digital spine this. And it is also, literature shows that even, uh, even before the advent of the stenoscope, they were using it uh, extensively for treatment of uh, intrahepatic stones, and it is being used for hepatolithiasis extensively, percutaneously, and also intraoperatively. Uh, and I can all I can say is actually there is increasing role in the management of stone structures and tumors. The newer thinoscopes with improved digital imaging seem to, with improved maneuverability, seem to have improved the peripheral access. And I think with more and more data coming in and more expertise that are available, I think this can make big inroads into the management of uh, Lady tumors in the liver resections, and uh, like it has changed the management uh, in the other, in the forehead surgery and colorectal surgery. I'm sure in the days to come, we'll be able to pick up uh, small lesions and even lesions which are not picked up on conventional endoscopy, being picked up by this, and then they maybe will have better outcomes of uh, apatoglyly surgery in future. Thank you once again for introducing this. Uh, me allowing me to introduce this topic of intraoperative phalangoscopy. A brief presentation just to complete the overall presentation. Uh, from this, actually, now uh, we go on to the, the last presentation uh, of the session. It is by Professor Shrikande, who is going to talk to us about the future of HPV surgery in India. Professor Shrikande is the president of uh, IHPV in India. He has been very active academically and also on the executive side of the IHPBA International. He's got phenomenal work, uh, both clinical and the research actually, and has got innumerable publications to his credit. I've asked Professor Shrikande to share his views on 
the future of HPV surgery, what he feels actually is being associated with Professor Jagannath, uh, mentored by Jagannath, and I think is doing great job. Uh, Professor Shikande. Uh, Greetings from Mumbai from the Tata Memorial Hospital. I would like to thank Dr. G.V. Rao for inviting me for this talk. A real pleasure to be here with Dr. G.V. Rao, Nageshwar Reddy, Dr. Jagannath uh, for this educational activity supported uh, by Olympus. I wear my hat as the president of the Indian chapter of the IHPBA, and the topic is rather a broad topic, asking me to talk on the future of HPV surgery in India. Now, what's the need for developing HPV surgery in India? This is the data from the Tata Memorial Hospital, one of the biggest, if not the biggest cancer hospital in India. And you can see the light blue bars which show the kind of admissions that we get to see. Even in the pandemic year in COVID-19, we have seen close to 62,000 new patients of cancer at the Tata Memorial Center. Now, what about some of the common cancers in India? In the left box, you see the common cancers. These are oral, gastric, lung, cervical, and breast cancers. But there are certain cancers which are also common just because of the sheer numbers in India that require complex treatment. Gastric and esophageal cancer, pancreas cancer, liver cancer, gallbladder cancer, which is endemic in some parts of India, as well as rectal cancer. The challenge is that India belongs to a low and middle income country. And what you see here is the kind of economic effect of not investing in cancer surgery in low income and middle income countries. So because of this lack of cancer surgery investment in low middle income countries, the economic impact in trillions of US dollars is something what you can see. And those who are interested in knowing more about this should see this publication of the Lancet Oncology Commission, where I had the opportunity to be a part of the group uh, and come up with some very interesting data. This is the cancer scenario in India. You can see that we have divided this into five major zones, and it's only in the southern part of India that you have more recognized oncology departments, you have good radiotherapy access and centers, you have more oncology fellowships, and they are available for a population which is manageable. Compare that to central or eastern India, and it's very obvious that India continues to live in different centuries at the same time. So what has been my experience and being a player and being the leader in developing HPV surgery at the Tata Memorial Center for close to two decades now? I'm going to use an example of pancreatic surgery that we have done over the last two years, uh, two decades at the Tata Memorial. I'll focus on the importance of technique and standardization, then the technique and emerging concepts of borderline resectable disease, uh, doing more complex pancreatic resections, moving on to minimal invasive access, as well as minimal invasive pancreatic resections, the important aspect of learning curve, mentoring and training, not just about surgery, but other concepts around surgery that improve outcomes, the relevance of good quality data, and of course, the role of the Indian chapter of the IHPBA. This is Marcus Buchler, a mentor and a leader in pancreatic surgery from Switzerland and then later on in Heidelberg for the last few decades. I had the fortune to spend a lot of time with him and he continues to mentor me along with Helmut Fries, who's the chairman of surgery in the University of Munich. I learned how to do a pancreas anastomosis at the turn of the century. This is one way of doing it, joining the pancreas to the jejunum in two layers, opening the jejunum to the size of the width of the pancreas, taking some ductal sutures which make it into a ductal mucosa anastomosis, and taking some other sutures which make it into a dunking anastomosis. Previously, we were doing pancreatic gastrostomy at the Tata Memorial. We moved on with prospective recording of data. And you can see that in the first four years, we had much better results when it came to less bleeding, less fistula, less mortality. And myself and my colleague, Parul Shukla then, we started feeling that pancreatic surgery is fairly easy. So clearly what we realized in these first four years was that God is in the details. The standardization of surgical procedures 
as a precondition to quality, I feel is important for all aspects of hepatopancreatic biliary surgery when you ask me about my vision for HPV surgery for the rest of India. Moving on, this is a more complex tumor which we started appreciating sometime in 2006, seven and eight. And we documented an initial series of tumors which could be considered as inoperable or operable 12 years ago. And this was when they were in intimate contact with the vasculature. And we published a small series of 12 patients, thanks to good radiology, which focused on the length of contact with the blood vessel, circumferential contact, and venous deformity. We also learned that greater the circumferential contact and greater the venous deformity, higher the chance that you have to resect the vein and then join the vein again. But here I take a pause to tell you what I strongly believe in. Unless you sweat in peacetime, you will bleed in wartime. Excellence is a decision practiced daily to the point of a habit. Why do I say that? Well, I wanted to do the more difficult tumors. I went back and invested another week or nine days in 2009 in Heidelberg just to learn the superior mesenteric artery first technique. The conventional approach has always been the right medial approach for doing a Whipple resection, but I also focused on other approaches to the superior mesenteric artery and then compared the infracolic approach with the supracolic approach in a series of 42 patients, some of which were straightforward pancreatic resections. But as I said, unless you sweat in peacetime, you will bleed in wartime. But if you do sweat in peacetime, then when you get the difficult tumors, you can operate on them. This picture shows you that I've got an SMA first. I've got complete vascular control. There is a tumor hanging only on the vein. A vein resection has been done. And then I'm able to do a type 3 eyes, GPS, and astomosis in a post-chemotherapy pancreatic head cancer, which was involving a segment of the superior mesenteric vein. Despite this surgical progress, this is what I saw from pathology, that our R1 rates for a pancreatic head cancer is 57%, the bile duct cancers is 20%, and even the relatively smaller, better biology tumors like the ampullary tumors is 7%. Clearly, we are dealing with tumors which have more aggressive biology, and it's not only about the technique. And this was not only for vein resections, even for resectable pancreatic tumors without vein resections, these were the R1 rates. Now we have gone to a stage where we know we produce R1, but we also know that we can convert borderline resectable to resectable. And now even 20 to 30% of locally advanced unresectable can become borderline or resectable disease. And this is thanks to modern day chemotherapy, which is beyond the purview of my talk. And so I share with you an example of a locally advanced unresectable pancreatic head cancer. Celiac axis, proximal hepatic arch, all encased. Inoperable in a large number of cases, but with good response to chemo, good response biochemically, good response in terms of performance status, and having good vasculature supplying the liver, in this case, the gastroduodenal artery, what have we done? We have done a modified apple B. We've done a subtotal pancreatectomy with a celiac axis resection. The hepatic artery is resected in a patient who got folferinox and radiotherapy. But if there would have been a need, we would have reconstructed and grafted the common hepatic artery to supply the liver. This work, is now being done more aggressively by my younger colleagues who have joined me as a part of my team. And that's Dr. Manish Pandare in this picture. What we all need to realize is that disease is very old and nothing about it has changed. It is we who change as we learn what was formerly imperceptible. Moving on, we've started doing more extensive resections, whether it comes to arterial replacements or doing multivisceral resections especially in the post Folferinox era, ever since we got the data on adjuvant results of Folferinox being much better than gemcitabine. And this is again our work, which is nothing but a reflection of increasing confidence, lesser selection bias, and becoming more and more well-known as a referral center for pancreatic surgery. 
we haven't lost out on the importance of minimal access surgery. I was one of the leaders working on this consensus meeting for the World Congress of the IHPD in Sao Paulo in 2016. And this is what we came up with very clearly, minimal invasive left pancreatic resections, distal pancreatectomies is clearly in the domain of laparoscopic or robotic surgery, especially if there is no vascular involvement. Having said that, laparoscopic surgery is not easy to learn. And this is one example. Mark Basilink, a leader in Europe, they trained 32 surgeons from 17 centers in a dedicated fashion for over a year and a half. And then they ran a multi-center trial. Unfortunately, in the Leopard 2 trial, laparoscopic ripple resection was associated with more complication-related deaths. There was no difference in time to functional recovery. What came out of this trial, which was considered as a negative trial, is that experience, learning curve, and annual volume influenced outcomes. Does it mean that we are ending the story for laparoscopic ripple or robotic ripple resection? Not at all. You can see some of us, all stakeholders in pancreatic surgery, laparoscopic, open, minimal access surgeons. We met in Miami two years ago, and you can see my dear friend, uh, Go Wakabayashi, plus Horacio Aspen, Claudio Passi, Abu Hilal, and Kevin Conlon, all of us. And we were a part of a very large group of people who worked together to come out with these guidelines, the Miami International Evidence-Based Guidelines on Minimal Invasive Pancreas Resection. So this is very much work in progress. The circles in red show you the two Indian surgeons, Shrikhande and Palani Velu, and the other circle shows Dr. Sempil Nathan, who are driving minimal access surgery as far as HPV is concerned uh, in India. So we have been gradual and careful for minimal invasive pancreas resections. This is our updated data. So you can see that we have very acceptable mortality and morbidity rates, and we are doing more and more of laparoscopic and robotic resections in the circumstances and the time that is available to us. And we are clearly getting better. This is an old video uh, which I presented at the EAHPBA in Mines in 2017. So we do not have enough access to the robot. We get a robot once in 10 or 15 days, but our numbers are gradually increasing. The technology is great, but we still need to select out patients and we really need to be sure that we are not compromising both the short term as well as the long term outcomes of minimal invasive pancreatic resections compared to open resections. Moving on, what do I realize? We are talking of experience, learning curve, and volumes. So this is an old slide. It highlights the importance of investing in patience and time. You can't circumvent patience and you can't circumvent time if you want to master complex HPV surgery. So it takes about 60 cases for us to master something like pancreatic surgery. It was shown by Jennifer Seng way back in 2007. And there is enough work which is published after that. But essentially, this is something which has not changed. And this is something which is also driving concepts of centralization. So the patient's game, it's, it's for those who are in India watching this and who know about the game of cricket. This is what I will highlight about a legend uh, in the art of batsmanship around Dravid. This is like talking about the Chinese bamboo. You plant the Chinese bamboo seed and plant it to the ground and water and nurture the seed for an entire year and you do not see anything at all. In fact, you see nothing for five years. But all of a sudden, within a span of six weeks, the tree and the plant will grow to 90 feet. It will grow as fast as 39 inches every 24 hours. You can literally watch the plant grow. So what was this plant doing during these five years when it was apparently dormant. It was growing its roots. This is so applicable to HPV surgery. For five full years, it was preparing itself for rapid full growth. Without this root structure, the plant simply couldn't support itself for its future rapid growth. Some would say the plant grew 90 feet in six weeks. I would say it grew 90 feet in five years and six weeks. That's what I wish to tell you about HPV surgery as well. 
it's not only about surgeons, but it's also about the center and the operating team. This is our group of dedicated GI anesthetists who drive our enhanced recovery pathway. And we clearly see that by closer coordination with our pathologists, with our anesthetists, and all the players who make up the team of HPV surgery, we are able to produce better results than ever before. I do not believe that you can learn something and then relax. You have to keep on learning and training and specialization is an ongoing lifelong process, if I may say, based on my last 23 years of experience in GI surgery. This is a paper where we see a lot of people who have not undergone resection in other hospitals. They have been referred to us. We have re-evaluated them and then we have been able to offer them pancreatic surgery, which ideally they should have got in the very first time itself. This did not happen because the surgeon felt that there was suspected or perceived vascular involvement. It means there was actually no vascular involvement. It was perceived or suspected. We did not feel it that way. We went in ahead and we could do a large number of these patients were offered definitive curative resections. India is a young country, but as the health improves, as the life expectancy improves, I can see a definite shift in the last two decades that we will start treating more and more older patients. This may not be new for Japan or for Europe or for England and America, but in India, the life expectancy is 65.9 years. But if a child lives for the first five years, the life expectancy goes to 75 years. So 20 years ago, I saw patients in their late 40s and early 50s uh, when it came to treating them for cancer in Tata Memorial. That age is creeping up now into the 60s. So clearly, we need to develop specialized teams and have the ability to deal with an older population with more comorbidities and immune compromised status and be prepared not for future shock, I would say near future shock when it comes to treating major HPV resections uh, in the elderly in India in the next decade. It's not only important about Tata, I also need to drive multi-centric studies from a country like India, the way you see it in Europe and Japan is very well known for that. This was our first effort and you can see my other young colleague, Dr. Vikram uh, Chaudhary and we have documented excellent work for cystic tumors of pancreas in India. This is my other colleague, Dr. Mayesh Goel, who drives the hepatobiliary service. We have documented a very large experience of gallbladder cancer surgery and tried to identify those locally advanced and borderline resectable cancers where we can define better indications, see how we can give multidisciplinary care and improve outcomes in a cancer which is quite aggressive as far as India is concerned. Even in hepatobiliary surgery, we have moved on towards robotic surgery for gallbladder cancer in selected groups of patients. Others would continue to get the more conventional open surgery. In the last part of my talk, I speak about what is my blueprint for developing HPV further in India. These are the volumes of pancreatectomy at the Tata Memorial. Even in the COVID year, thanks to segregation, we've continued our services and you can see that we did 190 pancreatic resections even in 2020 with fairly acceptable morbidity and mortality. We published our data of 1,200 ripple resections. This is not to show you that we did 1,200, but I think it's very important that quality outcome means that you keep on doing good work every day when nobody is watching. It felt good that Martin Smith, the immediate past president of the IHPVA, was very appreciative of our work, knowing that it's come out from a low middle income country and that it's going to be a guiding source of inspiration for other centers as well. Am I trying to say that centralization is the only way? Well, it's one of the way for complex HPV surgeries, not all HPV surgeries. And I said, it's only one of the way. Why do I say it's only one of the way? Because I share this journey with you of the last two decades. I learned something in a center of excellence in Heidelberg. I came back to India. I started working at the Tata Memorial, standardized it. We improved the volumes. We improved the outcomes. We improved the complexity. We started getting more people to train with us. We've got the largest super specialty training program for surgical oncology in the country. 
And in this map of India, you can see that there are about 35 surgeons who are capable of doing an excellent pancreatic resection for at least resectable disease it, with, with excellent outcomes, not only in tier one, but tier two and tier three cities of a vast country like India. So on one hand, you move towards centralization. On the other hand, you mentor, train, and develop other centers, especially in a country which is like a continent. And this is our effort for the Tata Memorial to spread ourselves, not just be in Bombay, but to spread to places like Varanasi, Vishakapatnam, or Vizag, and in Punjab. And it was a real pleasure for me to be visiting some of these centers, operating with the young surgeons over there in their environment and trying to show them what is easily possible with the same standards that I learned in Germany and which we have been able to implement uh, at the Tata Memorial. But is it only about surgery, teaching and training? No, when it comes to developing a cancer center or a center for HPV surgery, we need to look at geography, topography, conflicting considerations, influence political will as well as national policies, look at competing diseases which deserve priority over HPV. For example, you can't do away with malaria, tuberculosis, presently COVID-19. Look at market forces, develop a trained workforce, work on the kind of guidelines that I spoke about and assess the cancer burden based on population-based cancer registries. All these factors would come together to develop centers of excellence for HPV across the length and breadth of India. And this would be one of uh, the visions that I would have for India. It's also important to look at the cost. We don't have enough data about cost uh, implications, but I'm aware that a large number of Indians have out-of-pocket payments, unlike in Germany or Japan. So we clearly need to see what we can do to ramp up our insurance, to improve patient awareness, and to make uh, the lay public aware of the fact that medicine is unfortunately expensive and we need to invest well uh, so that we have a much healthier situation, both for the hospitals, the treating doctors, as well as for the patients who are suffering. What are the tasks ahead? And this is where I stop with my lecture. We are 1.2 billion population with 30% illiteracy. Not easy to deal with this. There are challenges of access and vast distances. We are trying to improve that. We still lack a foundation of authentic and detailed research, and we are trying to work on that, at least from centers like Tata Memorial. We need to motivate and retain good doctors and allied resource personnel in public health, in government health, which is accessible to the common man. We need to be more accountable and also improve our transparency when it comes to documentation and publishing and reporting outcomes. Clearly, we need to educate and train more doctors. Our doctor-patient ratio, our nurse-patient ratio is very poor as compared to some of the developed countries of the world. And then I did touch upon the fact that side by side in parallel, we need to work on improving the infrastructure as well. Thank you once again. And this is the team that is working closely with me at the Tata Memorial, the group of surgeons in the left upper picture, as well as the gastrointestinal and HPV disease management group comprising of medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, surgeons, interventional radiologists, pathologists, clinical trial coordinators, nutrition specialists, all of them working together for the benefit of GI and HPV services at the Tata Memorial Hospital. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Shailesh, uh, for a beautiful exposition. And uh, as a leader, you have shown what has been being done actually in India, actually, again, actually, uh, one of those things, actually, a number of publications from your center have led to big impact of uh, the work being done in India across the globe. Thank you so much once again. Uh, so we are running out of time. I think we have overshot the time, actually. Uh, we have a short presentation and uh, from Olympus. Actually, I think I hand over this, uh, the screen time to uh, Mr. Genta. Uh, then subsequently we'd have the final concluding remarks.
uh, hi uh, thank you dr rao and all the eminent faculties for the uh, such a neat and clean webinar so i would like to share the screen and uh, without taking much time we'll be sharing the uh, ppt yeah is it visible now yes yes yeah thank you so uh, thank you dr vivek which for putting up all the energy sources and uh, sharing a word on thunderbeat so from the olympus side we would like to represent our energy device that is thunderbeat and it's a very new technology and has discussed thunderbeat is the only device which will be providing you the ultrasonic cutting simultaneously with the bipolar sealing so that's the one energy system integrated system it's a combined energy system so all vessel sealing up to 7 mm spot coagulation grasping uh, very securely precise dissection and fast cutting using the ultrasonic technology so these are the concept of thunderbeat in which the thunderbeat device is working and what olympus is offering from our end it's a single instrument providing all the energy so when we compare about ultrasonic and bipolar if we can see ultrasonic is a, is a device which is generally been known for dissecting or cutting the particular tissue and similarly a bipolar vessel sealer is only been dedicatedly doing the vessel sealing up to 7 mm so what is the pro and cons uh, of course uh, certain instrument will have a pro and they will have a cons so for uh, the ultrasonic no influence for tissue impedance and uh, when we come to bipolar it's fast and homogeneous cutting when we come to thunderbeat so when we say has a thunderbeat device it's a single instrument providing you ultrasonic cutting and bipolar dissection uh by ultrasonic cutting and bipolar vessel sealing providing both the energy simultaneously with the single instrument so i would like to show one video how fast the thunderbeat is cutting the cutting speed and that is ultrasonic technology not with any mechanical blade and the technology was computerized and you can see It is comparatively so we are comparing to the cutting speed. We are getting a faster cutting speed technology. Now the second point would be the vessel sealing. So I would like to play this video. Vessel sealing up to seven mm is possible with the thunderbeat, and that too is the spot coagulation. Wherever you get the coagulation, where where the bleeder is coming. we can do it hence we can understand like in the hpv in the surgeries of lap hpv there are a lot of bleeding could we can encounter so at that particular point of time we can dedicatedly seal the or uh, coagulate the particular uh, tissue or the particular artery and simultaneously if the surgeon requires to dissect it also the possibility of ultrasonic dissection is also possible using a single instrument some of the advantage that we have is uh, in the instrument is if you can see a conventional technology uh in that one uh, we will have a wiper jaw mechanism in our instrument which will securely grasp grasping is powerful okay. so, secondly we have in, uh, incorporated itm it's an intelligent tissue monitoring so whenever there is a beep sound whenever the tissue is dissected between the jaws using the ultrasonic technology it will give a beep sound and 100% of the energy will be cut off from the instrument hence giving a safety to the adjacent tissues without much spreading of the energy and secondly the instrument life can also be enhanced with that part now uh, coming on to our monopolar technology whenever we are saying thunderbeat we are equipped with monopolar conventional monopolar technology conventional bipolar technology underwater cutting in saline for uh, uh, tuberous and tu uh, tuberous cases in gynecology and of course a thunderbeat technology uh, this is the one offering from olympus is a suction irrigation with monopolar i'll just show you the video which could be more easy for understanding so whenever there is a bleeder we can suck out and we can use a monopolar simultaneously and do the coagulation so this is the advantage uh, if we are uh, using a spot uh, coagulation with a monopolar instrument again our thunderbeat uh, can also be clubbed with an smoke evacuator and uh, it's an automatic smoke evacuation if you combine the thunderbeat instrument or thunderbeat device with that uhi4 from olympus 
it will be providing with an automatic smoke coagulator. So once you activate the Thunderbeat instrument, it will automatically take out all the smoke and mist that is generated whenever you are using a energy instrument. So you can see in the left hand side, there's a lot of smoke and mist, but whenever we are clubbing with UHI with the Thunderbeat, so the image is very clear. Hence it will provide a clear vision to the surgeon at the time of surgery. And also it's an insufflator, so it can provide you with both the advantages, insufflating and secondly, automatic smoke coagulator. So UHI-4 with Thunderbeat is possible from Olympus. So that's all from the from my side and wish you all the luck and thank you so much, Dr. Jivira, for, our time, for your time. Uh, thank you so much, Akili. It has been a beautiful, uh, wonderful seminar. Uh, seminar. Luckily, we had a lot of new information that came in, Akili, to show how uh, laparoscopic surgery, especially liver surgery, can become more safer. We have had great inputs from uh, different speakers from across the globe. Uh, we have had uh, very good uh, interactions, actually very good uh, take-home messages. And we also know that we have very good energy sources that are available from Olympus. Not only the energy sources, the imaging systems that are available from Olympus, the infrared ICG technology seems to have made big dent into the HPV practice as was shown by various speakers from Japan and also from India. I'm sure a lot of surgeons, young surgeons would take up this speciality, use this techniques, technology, and also the various uh, energy sources available to make sure they can practice this uh, HPV surgery more safe. Uh, thank you once again, uh, all the participants from uh, Japan and India, and thank you Olympus for the extensive uh, survey that you have done. And I'm sure we'll get good feedback from uh, surgeons across the globe and we'll continue this. I think we'll have the laparoscopic pancreatic webinar sometime very soon uh, uh, from the same group. Thank you so much once again. Uh, for all the participants, we have already shared the feedback form. So kindly